What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Serious Angler Podcast, powered by our friends over X2 Power Batteries. We're back with the captain, Mr. Andy Full, and I am your host, Bailey Agbra. Andy, thank you for holding down the fort last night for Fantasy ooh. Fishing. Talk about um, impromptu. I was like, ooh, I was like scrambling. <laughs> Andy, I think, was told two minutes after we were supposed to go live that he would be hosting because literally it was fine offline when we started, like getting everything ready off scene here. But then for whatever reason, my MacBook's like, oh, you want to go live tonight? Psych. I'm going to okay, do a three-hour update. And then it's uh, something went super haywire. Andy says, we'll blame the Eclipse. I'll rock with that. But it, it's working <laughs> right now. So fingers. It, dude, I don't know what it's been. The past six months have just been a technological nightmare. Yeah, it's technology. Between podcasting, GoPros for filming. Like, it's just been horrible. I don't know what it is. I'm just cursing. Cursing after another. It's, you're not cursed. It's just life. <laughs> Well, maybe the full household. You guys have some wild stuff that happens. Oh my gosh. Like it just never ends over here, but we don't need to get down that rabbit hole. We'll have enough rabbit holes tonight to dive into as we're talking offline. So those who are tuned in are going to have some fun stories to listen to, but how was Norman, man? Like, yeah, Yeah, we didn't get to talk about it much really at all because we haven't talked much since I got home. No, we talked, Uh, I think, like when you first got there for a brief second, you called me, but that's about it. Yeah. That, that's honestly the most time we ever get to talk is when I'm out in the water. Cause we were usually too damn busy yeah. any other time. Uh, uh, but yeah, I think our text messages are okay. And nice. 90% of the time. Yes. Like, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <Or> yes. <laughs> Sending fish pictures, tackle orders. And then that's very much it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> dude, Norman. Oh man. Norman was awesome. Um, we were saying a little bit offline too, but I was sending my wife some house listings on, on Norman <laughs> <laughs> after the after Friday of practice, just because that place was so much fun, man. Um, I think it's actually really cool. I was talking with uh, the because the Queens live down there, and honestly, that that's a hotbed for a lot of anglers. I mean, you got Shane LeHue down there, you got Hank Cherry down there, you got a star-studded lineup of at least touring pros that are from the Carolinas. Um, but I was just talking to Jeff about the area and different things like that. And it's crazy one, how much houses are worth. Well, on sure. Norman. Dude, Were they like one and a half million starting? I, yeah. Like it made me throw up when I pulled up Zillow, I was sitting there in practice going back to the ramp and, um, but it's just a really cool area, man. It's just very a fishy community. Um, unfortunately I didn't get to go. I wanted to go get dinner with KJ and Jeff and like that over the weekend, but fortunately couldn't, couldn't line up. Um, we, I don't know if everybody, if the OGs remember, we worked with Queen Tackle. Um, and we're still really good friends with the Queen, the Queen family. They're amazing people. Um, make sure you guys support them if you they make an amazing lineup of jigs. But, um, man, dude, Norman, we were talking about a little offline, but I had, I drove starting Wednesday at 6 p.m., got to the ramp at like 4, 4 30 in the morning, napped for an hour, uh, and got out on the water for day one of practice. Um, and just, it was cool. in the fact that my typical kayak, this was for the Hobie BOS event down there, uh, was actually still at Morgan Marine right now, getting all rigged up. Cause it's got pretty wild setup for this year. So he gave me an Outback, which is pretty bare bones, smaller, faster kayak. And, uh, basically was one in there super simple. It felt really good to be forced to be, you know, bring six rods, no electronics, just go fish shallow. Um, which is a great time of year to do it anyway. But, um, Went up shallow with a mag draft, a glide bait, and a jig, and got into them pretty quick. <laughs> uh, I was telling you guys offline, I caught like a four and a half on the glide, uh, caught like a, a three and a half on a jig, dumped like a five on a glide, and I'm sitting there like, man, this place is freaking fun. Uh, and then day two, went to finally got to go to the area I wanted to practice at because it was pretty windy that Thursday. And, dude, I, I rolled my hooks on on the glide so i wouldn't hook many fish if any at all and they were coming on freaking glued on that thing 
uh and it was it was so much fun man because it was it's a really cool area the lake's massive super diverse uh you can catch them deep you can catch them shallow you can do a whole mixture of things and uh um basically it was one on the way back to the ramp looking at house listings but two <laughs> putting in orders for some pretty wild glide baits that i told myself maybe a year ago i would never in any shape or form buy but here i am shopping for them so it's it's fed my glide bait addiction, which I know we're gonna get into today. But, uh it's gonna be a fun video, nonetheless. I I it, the the curse of losing big fish continues because uh dumped a five day one of tournament day on the glide, dumped like a four pound spot, and then of all things lost a four pound largemouth on a wacky rig. I don't know how that happened. It uh, must not have had the hook. I don't like, know what it was, but it was one of those docks because uh the docks they're actually pretty fun like they're just giant long thing like there's one that um people down there know what i'm talking about you know our, our guests offline meal will know what i'm talking about but they have at like, the foundation there's like it's like a circle and then it has like six different uh, pilings with like a couple in the middle and he, i just cast the wacky rig in there and it went through like a whole figure eight of them and i got them out of there after it wrapped me up a bunch of times i get it out and i'm like okay we're good now like if i didn't lose it in there we're not gonna lose it mm-hmm. and it just goes to the boat just spits. I'm like, of all places for me to lose this fish and I lose it right at the boat. But uh, anyway, it, amongst all that lost stuff, I still remain calm. I had, a, I was still positive. It, it, it was interesting that it didn't phase me as much, but it was just fun, man. Like it, it could have been a big day. Ended up 30th after the two days of a hundred and something. Um, but man, it was, I, every morning I got my limit within the first 15 minutes throwing top water, like hard to complain with that. Yeah. Just a fun time. Um, so highly recommend Norman Rome's cool place. Uh, a bunch of cool restaurants around to, to go to. But we can save that for another another day because we're already almost seven minutes in and we haven't gotten to a bunch of our news yet. And uh, I want to get our boy, Mr. Emil Wagner, here on the show, uh, who did a great podcast with Bass Talk Live. If you guys haven't uh, looked at that one or listened to that one yet, highly encourage you to. But then part two of today's show, we're going to get the University of Montevallo boys on, Tyler Corey and Scott Sledge, talk about their win. Uh, during Classic Weekend, uh, have a little bit of fun with those boys. But uh, real quick, the if you guys did not see last week, we put on our social media. We hit ten thousand followers on social media for Serious Angler, or I should say on Instagram for Serious Angler. Which appreciate everybody that's followed us. Uh, we're not like big on the whole like taking the follow numbers to heart, but it is a cool milestone nonetheless to see the growth of the platform. It, it's it is a cool thing to see as like a just being proud of the work we put in. Um, and that's all credit to you guys. So appreciate everybody that's that's followed along. And with that, we we did a little blackfish gear giveaway. And so with that, we'll we're gonna announce the winner tomorrow morning. So this is us letting you know there is one more evening, if you will. There's so still a couple what, hours four left. Four hours to, left to get in. Four hours left to get in. Simply all you gotta do is follow us on Instagram. If you're already following us, you're already entered. Um, uh, but there are extra entries if you follow. Uh, kayak fishing weekly or the lure lab as well you get some ex- uh, five extra entries uh, for that but nonetheless super proud of that um we'll Sean so. wants to know if you lost something on your face yeah yeah <laughs> i actually i got some compliments on the stash man but i, I had it was mixed comments some people were like what is that what is that caterpillar right there and some people were like shouldn't let you near school then some people are like hey nice stash yeah, I, yeah. We're, no. the wife gets the final ruling yeah. The okay. next time you fish a kayak derby, you have to show up with the stash in like a Canadian tuxedo. So just pure denim, denim yeah. jeans, yeah. denim jacket. <laughs> What's up, guys? <laughs> that'd be that'd be a sight. Hey, that's funny. The guy I started, I started with uh, actually shared a point with a Canadian guy uh, day one into Nate Conley, super cool dude. Um, so it's funny you mentioned <laughs> showing up. He's like, hey, bud. <laughs> Hater. What, what, hey there, bud. What you doing on this point? <laughs> hey there, Holzer. Get off my point, eh? Uh, oh, all right, enough of making fun of Canadians. Um, so for Omnia Fishing, real fast for you guys, they're running a bunch of sales. 20% off of Beast Coast, 25% off of BKK Hooks, which is a wicked deal. And then buy one, get one. I think it's a yearly thing that P-Line does um, that's going on as well at Omnia. We got the links down below if you guys want to go check those out. Um, but definitely save yourself some money. Beast Coast Hooks or beast coast beast coast jigs uh you guys heard us talk about it especially you've heard on the lure lab countless times there's a reason you hear so much about them is because they're pretty damn good um it hurts to talk about them but we have to oh look i have one right here there you go i I had one a football jig sitting on my desk for ages and i actually threw away the other day because it was finally rusted um 
But beyond that, the jeez, I'm a mess over here. You can tell I haven't podcasted in a while. Um, the Omnia Premium uh, map, they just dropped a new feature. I don't know if you guys have seen this, but for our research warriors out there, Emil will probably know what I'm talking about. So on Google Earth, you can scroll back and see history. Of they added history map, now? Things like that. You now have a history feature for the water temp. I think it's just a water temp. I could be wrong. It could be clarity too. Um, mm. They have a water temp history feature. So now you can go see in recent days, I believe I haven't played with it around too much yet, but you can go back and see how the water temperatures have progressed, which if you're fishing right now, springtime. That is one hell of a feature to have, um, especially if they do water clarity too, because that could be pretty dang interesting. But check those out. If you're not a premium pro member yet, um, you guys save a lot of money. I think it's 50 bucks for the year. You get 10% back on all of your orders. So if you do a $200 tackle order, they give you 20 bucks that you can now go use on free tackle. So uh, definitely advantageous to be. Yeah, how many times off the top of your head do you think you've spent $200 on a tackle order? A lot. Basically every order. Almost. Just give, give me like a number, right? That I've spent at least 200. Uh, yeah. A hundred times? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> a lot. So, uh, all right. Well, let's take like random math, right? Like 200 times by, we'll divide it by what? 17? Or, no, it'd be 17 times 20 because 10%. So you'd make $340. <laughs> so you basically get almost two free shopping sprees at 17 orders for you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's you spend a grand, you get 200 bucks. Like it's $200 free tackle. It's a no brainer. Yeah, for, for tackle junkies like us, it's definitely an advantage to have, as, as well as the map features, which I use pretty dang heavy going into Norman, having zero electronics. A uh, little nugget for that, I, I I used the Omni map, I used the Hummingbird One Boat Network app, and I used a meat thermometer <laughs> for my real-time surface I, saw that. I, was, I think you sent us like a group picture, and I was like, oh, dear God. <laughs> well, also, awesome. the best part was is... I never told my wife I was doing that. She saw my post on Instagram. She sent me a text today. She goes, bro, did you take our meat thermometer down there? And I was like, no, I didn't take ours. I bought one from like a gas station, but you, you don't need the fancy graphs to do it in the springtime. They definitely help, but you don't, you don't need it. Enough of my rambling. Know where they're going. Yeah. If we told yeah. them six, seven minutes and we doubled it. Yeah. <laughs> Typical rants on our behalf, you know? Yeah. Sorry, Emil. Yeah. Well, so without further ado, let's bring him on here, Mr. Emil Wagner. Let's go it on, dude. What's up, fellas? Y'all can rant however long you want. You're not hurting my feelings. <laughs> well, let, let's kick it right off, right? Like, let's dive right into a rabbit hole. So, where do you want to go with this? Floor well, shores. first, dude, Norman's a weird one. Like, I, I don't know. I was just sitting here thinking about that because I've had some tournaments there in the fall. And, like, you're talking about all these four and five pounders and stuff. Like, that's one of those lakes where, like, March and April, it shows out, and then other than that, the weights literally pretty much suck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Does that, that drive you happens? insane when you go to fisheries like that? You're like, I know there's big ones here, but I know if I get eight pounds today, there's a good chance I'm going to cash a check. It's like, yeah. oh, And no well, Norman's one of those weird ones where I actually feel like there's a decent amount of good ones. They just literally don't bite year-round. Like, you go there in the summer. I'm not saying you can't have a good day there in, like, June or October or something, but it's just – I don't know. It's kind of trash. Like, I remember they had that big college tournament there in March, like, two years ago. It was, like, a Bassmaster Open. Everyone was like, there's no way that's on Norman. 17 pounds was, like, 10th place or something. It was unreal. Yeah. Well, apparently, it keeps getting better. According to, um, I was talking with Jeff Queen uh, a while back. This was probably two months ago. He was saying that a lot of the local trails, what they're doing is they take, like, the 12 to 14 inchers. And they just keep them. They bring them with them. And they've just been trying to call as many Smart. little fish as they can. And it seems to be helping. If that's, I mean, that, that's a logical yeah. reason to see uh, to be benefiting. Um, but like, it's the weights keep going up, man. Like they were, they were shocked to think the, there was a a giant charity tournament that ran the same day that had some some hammers in it, and I think like eighteen pounds won when it's been taken twenty one to twenty four all this year so far to win on Norman, which is. It's That's crazy, insane. man. It's yeah. It I would you got what, third? Those, what's that? You got third, you said? That was on Murray a month ago. Uh, I got thirtieth. Thirtieth of hundred. I got you. Still yeah. good. Yeah, three just add a zero to it, right? It sounds the same if you take out. <laughs> I'll, the zero. I'll take third. Yeah, we can change it. <laughs> oh, yeah. 
Oh, yeah. no, it was it was in Norman fashion though. It was super stacked. Like going into day two, I was in 42nd, and I was uh, so let's try and put this in perspective. I was 10 inches behind first, so that's probably four or five Ten pounds. Inches. Four or five pounds, maybe difference. Gotcha. So like me for and I was five inches away, I think, from top 15, which is maybe two and a half pounds, which is crazy stuff. It's a kicker, basically. Yeah, like if That's I didn't nice. dump one of those fish, I would have been right there. Um, which is, it's everybody has those stories. You can never lean on those. I still laugh at those stage things where it's like, oh yeah, I had the ones to do it. Or it's yeah, buddy, you and seventy other people do. Um, but it was it was crazy. Like to your point, how many big fish are actually there? Like it's nuts. Day one was a little bit windier, so I stuck to the glide most of the day. But day two was straight. You know blue skies no clouds no wind whatsoever got real hot and just knew like going into it i'm gonna have to throw the glide first thing and then once sun gets up like it's gonna be pretty hard to get them on the glide there because i just got follows follows. but it was crazy how many there was probably four or five four and a half five pounders i saw just sitting under docks that like i literally dragged my wacky rig over one's back because it just wouldn't dude they're ghost fish yeah we get them around like they're, I think the only way to catch them is to like lead them on with a top water or maybe get lucky with a wacky worm. But yeah, those cruising fish this time of year are so dang hard to catch. Oh, well, so there was, too. There was two of them funny. that like you could tell that they were in that funk where they wanted to spawn. They're getting ready to spawn. They're just like the most immobile. Or they're already done. I mean, we had a big wave two weeks ago already, but yeah. They very well could. I mean, especially when you think about Norman, because they have that whole power plant deal in the south end that right. warms it up quick. Apparently, they have spawners in like February, which is a whole different dynamic. But it was just, yep. it was crazy to see some. It was the most frustrating thing because you see a fish that doesn't see you yet, that's facing away from you, that's sitting right under a dock perfectly, and you lay a, a wacky rig softly right in front of its face. In the north, you're gonna catch that fish. I was gonna say these are southern <laughs> bass. They're stupid educated. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh yeah, I've seen that three hundred thousand times the last week. We're not gonna. Yeah. Get that. Usually they swim away from you, even if you stay way off and do everything right. But it was it was crazy the stuff I learned, and it was uh, I'm I usually hate fishing docks, but I actually th- thoroughly enjoyed breaking down the docks on that lake because there's obviously a million docks, but it was um. It was cool to see certain. You could tell which docks had owners that fished because there's cr- like fresh Christmas trees still shoved under these oh, docks. Yeah. You see the tops like, of them, yeah. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> I'm gonna fish that one. <laughs> yeah. And that's usually you probably, when you, I'm assuming most of the bites you got. And it could be different during the spawn, but it's probably on those dredge docks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's cool. You could see like the different the different coloring. Like you could see yeah. where. Yeah, it was. It's pretty interesting. Like, there's some springs on some on points too. Like, it was it was pretty intriguing to see. And those are the ones you knew you were gonna get bit on. I mean, caught a bunch of fish regardless. Um, but man, I was sitting there. I'm like, we were talking a little bit offline. Like, I don't know if I can leave the north just because of smallmouth. But I was telling my wife, I was going back in after day two. I'm like, I, don't, I think spotted bass might be the solution to that because these things are fun. Dude, it dude, was that's nor- you haven't yeah you haven't, you still haven't seen much if you're talking about Norman no. spotted bass. I mean. I know I'm preaching to the choir here, Mr. Lanier, because that is yeah. that is top of the bucket list, especially after come after down any time. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna make it happen. But dude, I got a clip that I'll have to send you after this. Uh it'll be on the video. But I was taking a call shad and I was burning it behind a dock, and I had one just scream up and blow it up right at the boat. And I figure eight it, got it to eat again, set the hook on it, came flying out. And I'm like, these things are freaking turbo missiles. Like it's <laughs> Yo, turbo missiles. I love that. It's nuts. <laughs> I loved it. Yeah, well, the frustrating, the frustrating thing about the coal shad thing for spots is like, I got on that like four years ago or so. Like now, everyone throws it here, but like I kind of got to see it before it got. Just everyone started throwing it, and literally, it was almost every single dock. You'd have a big one come out, but the spots they just come out and headbutt it ninety percent of the time. They don't ever eat it. The largemouth will get it, so like you can throw it on Hartwell in a tournament. Not saying you couldn't on Lanier, but the spots are bad on that thing. Because, like, they can headbutt a glide or something and still get hooked. But that thing, they kind of have to eat it to get it. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, I ended up figuring – I don't know why it took me so long. I think it's because I, I didn't really throw it too much day one because I was throwing the glide instead. But um, 
I ended up like around 10 a.m. the last five hours just straight up just taking the call shed and burning docks. It didn't take me till like the last hour to realize I should have put a freaking stinger hook on this thing. What am I doing? And so I took like, I think I had 15 pound mono and I rigged it to like a size eight Ichikawa towards the tail and I started actually sticking some. And that definitely kind of helped because they'd come up and headbutt the tail. Even on a six inch call shed, it's crazy how much they can like, they can get of that's not, right. you know, it, it was, it was pretty nuts. But it was it was such a cool fishery, man. Um, learned a lot about it, and it's it's crazy. That's crazy you did that because I've thought about putting a stinger on it, but it's just one of those things that I've thought about and not done because I thought it would mess the action up. But good on you for actually doing it because it exposing. didn't mess it up at all. It was crazy. I thought t- the same thing. Yeah, yeah I'm a hundred percent gonna try that. Now. I just put like a heavier Nico weight in the call shad too, so that you could burn it a little bit faster. Nice. But which is nice because they actually have the slots in the call shed where you can yep. go and do yep. that. Yeah, it's got two in there. I don't know. I've tried it with them, but I usually just throw it straight up without them. But I'm have to try yeah. that. Well, my my last remarks on Norman is I still hate a freaking fluke. I can't stand a damn fluke. So I'm gonna ask the the expert here. What hook do you use in a fluke? Because I can't find dude. The, I, okay, I'm gonna get this <laughs> off my chest now because it's been burning me up since since Sunday. I. Sorry, this was Saturday. I dumped that four pound spot on the glide and it was still chasing the glide after I lost it, which I love about spots. So you can, yeah. They, yeah. I flipped the fluke uh, out at this fish. The fish comes back up, swallows the fluke. My fluke is gone. And 15 pound test, jack them on a, on a seven foot medium heavy. The fluke comes flying out of its mouth on a, I think it was yeah. a four out EWG. Yeah. Yeah, and sometimes there's nothing you can do about that. I promise you, I've tried every hook combo on planet Earth. I've done the hitchhikers, nose hooks, <laughs> worm hooks with treble hooks threaded onto them with spinnerbait keeper on them, line throughs. And with they treble still hooks. pop out and fly by. Oh, dude, I promise you, I throw it on a four rot worm hook straight up. That's <gasps> it. And the whole deal, if you rig it perfectly, the, the, the reason I do it is because. On that worm hook, it's the only hook you can get the right action on. If you nose hook it or do anything else, like it might look all right, but if you hook it perfectly on a four aught worm hook or a three aught worm hook, when you pull it, it pulses like a Sabeel. And that's the whole deal with it, in my opinion, is getting it to work right. But I throw it on a spinning rod too. So I feel like, and I don't set the hook. Like when I see them eat it, I pretty much just keep reeling like you would on a. Now, do you jack them or do you sweep? No, them? no, I just, I just sweep into them because if, dude, if you, if you ever hit them with slack, I feel like it messes up ninety <laughs> percent of the time. Yeah, exactly. I think it's because it's so much plastic. Yeah, yeah, I'll be bleeping out some words on that clip. That's yeah, no, trust me. I've, I promise you, I've probably bleeped out a lot more than you have. Um, yeah, yeah, I was looking. I was editing through. I've got three tournaments deep of SD card footage that I was ignoring. And I finally got to it today and I was like, God, this is bad. <laughs> it's more comical. I think people enjoy that dips. It's it's there's a lot of professional stuff out there that's really good, but people like that that hardcore, like real yeah. real yeah. footage. But uh just yeah, make but sure your market's like, not safe for kids and you'll be all yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but occasionally whole... you'll just have like a Scott Martin level meltdown and you're like, Yeah, thank God that wasn't yeah. live. Yeah, <laughs> I ended up doing the. Uh, and I'm curious, do you do this as well? Like the whole, um, you take like the hook and you put a, a treble hook on the bottom, then rig your fluke and then stick the treble on the bottom. Yes, and my tournament partner still does it behind me when we're throwing it, and he's caught a few bonus fish on it. But for me, I haven't. It it affects the action and it annoys me, and it I haven't caught enough on it for me to make it worth the downsides of it if that makes sense but i could 100 percent see an argument for it so yeah. like i got a buddy who's really good at the house like we're neck and neck a lot he does it and he catches a lot of big ones on it that he wouldn't have caught so like maybe it's I don't like know, a maybe there's a good ratio. chance yeah there's a good chance this summer i go back to it like i'm always tinkering and whatnot but no, i don't know this is that straight four out worm hook it's just so efficient it's never messed up or kinked up it's just i just love it yeah, it, it was it was so frustrating because like I'd get a bunch of bumps on it, like these 16, 17 inch spots yeah. that come out and throttle. 
the line. They wouldn't get it. And the only follow-up bait that they would actually come back and eat, like they wouldn't touch the wacky rig. They wouldn't touch nothing else. Jerk bait, nothing. They would only come back and eat the, the fluke. And it was like, I couldn't hook them to save my life. I just, there's several times I look at the camera. I'm like, this is why I hate the hell out of a fluke. This is why I don't yeah. throw it up here. And just, usually if you can see them eat it, it's way worse. Like a lot oh, of yeah. times when I throw over like, a brush pile like if i got the right conditions and there's a bunch of them and like you pretty much know you're gonna get bit it's just a matter of are you gonna catch it or not i'll work it and try my best to not be like glued to what it's doing because then a giant one will eat it especially in like a high pressure case scenario like a big tournament and i don't care who you are you you mess it up quite <laughs> a bit of the time you almost want to like count to three and just start reeling when you feel them and just kind of lean right no just keep working it and look at your scope and then if it gets heavy just <laughs> yeah. just lean in real faster <laughs> yeah exactly well, that's good to know are, are you a braid to floor guy on the fluke then yeah 10 8 pound braid to usually on a fluke 10 pound leader because i don't think eight or six would get me many extra bites Sometimes, like in a big turn, like if there's a lot on the line and they're eating it pretty good, I'll throw 12 because I have broken off on 10. But usually, usually 10 pound lead or 8 pound braid 90% of the time. That's okay. what I throw on most stuff, honestly. Sometimes on a worm, I'll throw eight. Like Nico rigging, I throw eight. Shaky head, I throw 10 because it's down there, like in the rocks and stuff. But yeah. I never go lighter than eight. I got you. Are you a, a twitch tail fluke or are you like the, the bulbous tail? Kind of guy Dude, I, i've got like four different ones i throw and now we could do a whole episode on that but it sounds like no. a lab to me, Andy. good fluke yeah. episode yeah yeah i already told jody had me on and tried that's the one thing i don't uh probably i'm not a liar <laughs> you just, break it down. <laughs> no yeah they're there yeah we we probably just couldn't touch on some of that but no there is like the <laughs> um obviously the berkeley one's good it's got the max scent and everything i throw that one the zoom one has probably the best colors um the yamamoto one's got good weight to it and a good action the strike king one's really heavy and has some decent colors nobody's making a perfect one yet i'll say that much but have you tried yeah, they the, they all depending on the conditions and the time of year and how they're set up i i have i have way too many dude i've got three tubs and like in a tournament when i'm throwing it i keep every single tub because like if the oh he sounds like me with flatworms. I got like four tubs of flatworms in my boat at all times. Yeah. Like every color for every situation. It just it never ends. You can never have enough flukes yep. apparently for spots as to where we can have flatworms for small mouth. Yeah, I definitely see right, that. Well, and the, the flukes, I can justify it because I guide out here five days a week and you throw it in tournaments and like I actually use them like I yeah. don't know how many packs I'll go through a year and that goes for top waters hard swim baits but like those you're obviously not burning through them unless you're breaking them off but right yeah I've I've got a lot of them that's for sure <laughs> well enough for the fluke talk because that's just making me mad still yeah, making me anxious that. so we can yeah. move on yeah <laughs> I just dude I was sitting there like dumbfounded because I literally watch the fluke just completely disappear in this big spot's mouth. Like it's clear as day, and I just oh. I'm like, oh, there's no way. I jack him, and I'm like, how? <laughs> there's not a worse feeling either. You've worked yeah. your tail off to get the bite, and then you finally get it, and you're like, well, there's no turning back on that one. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was a, there was a few of those, that's for sure. But changing subjects on that, uh, how deep are you down the rabbit hole of glide baits? So, yeah, we, we were kind of touching on that. Um, and I mentioned that I recently got pretty far down the rabbit hole, probably a little too far. And uh, I bought five of show, these. Show that case to the camera. <laughs> I bought five of these. Yeah. <laughs> Oops. Yeah, whoops. And then two of the trouts, which there's zero chance I ever throw. But they're I pretty know sweet. I'll take them off your hands if you don't want those. Trouts. I've got these. I've got quite a few of the resin chads. Um some other random ones, but I'm not like, I don't have a bunch, but he's not into the rabbit hole yet, but he bought five. Hands. No. And honestly, I don't <laughs> see myself getting too crazy. Like I That's usually, they like... all say a meal. Yeah. Don't worry. <laughs> I said that a year ago. <laughs> Bailey well, said no, he would never like, throw hey, one. That's more than $60. Yeah. And now he's got a cart full. <laughs> well, this was, this was a justified purchase because at the Okeechobee open, I weighed like two of the fish the first day I caught on it. They were both five pounders. And then, 
I broke off like a seven on the only one I had and it came flying out of the water with it in its mouth. So I was like, yeah, I'm buying a bunch. Yeah. I remember that. Clip but you had. that, that I got makes... these three custom painted. Y'all can give me your opinion. I got all different colors. That's the first one. It's a, let me see if we can get some better. Oh, that's like a that. beautiful gizzard. That's like a straight thread fin color. Is that thread fin? Yeah. I don't, dude, who knows? <laughs> it's a shad. Yeah, it's some kind of a shad. A <laughs> It'll mimic all of it. <laughs> and uh, then this one's kind of the same. Honestly, it looked different in the picture, but it looks pretty sweet. Yeah. And it, then it's got a little bit lighter colors, like more contrast. This, yeah, and this is my favorite one. It's the red fin, and it's got like a purple haze. This lighting really isn't doing any oh, yeah. justice. No, you can but... see it. You can see it. it. That's like the popular one, isn't it? With the red fin? Um, yeah, I think Milliken made that like carp color pretty famous. This isn't quite that, but it, uh, Ill fish it, like it. Yeah, it, it looks pretty sweet, but I haven't gotten into I know like you got to put weight on them and like mess with them and stuff to get them perfect. But that one I was throwing at Okeechobee was actually a phony that uh, my buddy had uh, modded or messed around with a little bit so you can chop it faster. And I think that was why I was working so well, because when they get on it, I was moving it to get them to eat it. Like it was no just like like I was I was really moving it. And that's. That's how I like to fish in general. So I don't know. I'll have to see if I can get these to do that. But <laughs> that's badass. Now you said you had trout ones that you're not going to throw. Yeah. Well, I've even got them painted, but I got two up there and they're like the size of my shoe. So I don't maybe, <laughs> maybe fun fishing in North Georgia or something, but the odds of that ever being thrown in a tournament, I could pretty much guarantee you. Or ah, I will hit it guaranteed. Yeah. It'll, yeah, it would definitely come up and look at it and headbutt it or something, but <laughs> Dude, even You're like that's what I'm saying though. Like even the coal shot thing, like or a six inch glide or whatever. Like I'll throw it in tournaments, but in my opinion, ninety percent of the time, it's more of a heartbreak lure than it is a win a tournament lure. And that's why you see like even on the elites, the last couple of years, like glides have kind of been the craze. And don't quote me, but I still don't think anyone's won a tournament on it. I I think they've had one or two bonus fish in their bag with it. And you know, like I remember. Carl was leading that Chickamauga tournament in March two mm -hmm. years ago on it and then just fumbled the second day. Like it's, yep. I don't, I still don't think it's a tournament winning bait, but it definitely like if you hit the right day with it and the right conditions on the right lake, you can, you yes. can blast them with it, but no. I'm still not, it's, it's, it, you know, you gotta, you gotta throw it when it's necessary, but, but I will say that that time in Florida on, on Okeechobee, they were, destroying it like it was the deal and i was very sad when i broke that one off i can imagine <laughs> it was hard and, and you lost an expensive bait yeah like i broke it off and i looked on scope and i could see him swimming and he just starts coming straight to the surface and i was like here we go and sure enough like it was one of those that couldn't even come fully out of the water just like wallered and you could see it <laughs> you're like oh, no. No. yeah it was just just brutal it was brutal gosh yeah, just... I was throwing the quad hooks on it too. Those things are legit. That was my first time trying those. Yeah, I did definitely did not order a bunch of those. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm, I'm screwed. I was, I'm, I'm done. I'm done for now. But here, might my as well question... quit tournament fishing now, Bailey, because if the uh, glides are gonna outcost your tournament winnings at this point. We'll be fine. Yeah, so, right. yeah, and I'll never, dude. I'll never like <laughs> not throwing shade, but some of the guys in the you know how the swim bait community is. It's so like, you know, everything's got to be. Uh, gotta yeah, there's be perfect, definitely but... some, I don't want to say entitlement's the word, but it's, but it's... Th there's some of that going on for sure. Yeah. But, I mean, hey, all the power to him because like it's, it's like the true style, I would say, out of everything we do in fishing right now, the true style of hunting, like hunting for a trophy. Yeah, is, for sure. Yeah. For sure. And there's there's a ton of skill to throwing a big bait. But at the same time, and again, I hope no one takes this the wrong way, but it is kind of like, I feel like some people will throw it all day for three days and act like it's this crazy thing. I'm like, it's also kind of a cop out thing to do, right? Yeah. You don't have to, you don't really have to figure anything out. You just have to throw it all day. And if yeah, you just run to it, points and yeah, yeah. If you get bit on it, you're knocked. a hero. And if you don't, it's like, oh, well, I was throwing a swim bait. So everyone should understand why I didn't get bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's the excuse for like, yeah, but I'm a man. I threw a swim bait all day. I didn't. Yeah, I, didn't I got like the ultimate comparison. If anyone knows like steelhead fishermen, like 
the cream of the crop steelhead fisherman is like a spay guy. They use like a 13 foot rod throw like flies that look like well, I have one like this, like just big balls of hair. This the glide bait fisherman is the equivalent of a steelhead spay fisherman. They spend thousands of dollars to catch one fish a month. Yep. So like, <laughs> yeah. Now, if I lived in Texas or somewhere, it would definitely Absolutely. be like someone like Milliken who's actually taking it to, you know, he's definitely had good tournament results with it. And uh, like he's probably, I'm sure I haven't watched them all, but he's probably won some of those local tournaments. He's fished with it. And uh, yeah, there's definitely, definitely a time and place for it, but yeah, we'll see. Sure. I'll, I'll probably get into it more this summer. Well, and I think there's That's a reason. The rabbit hole expands. Right. Yeah. We'll have a, we'll have a glide bait follow-up show. There we go. Yeah. Uh, three that is in the rods closet now. Yeah. <laughs> We're just going to check in on a meal's addiction here. <laughs> that was the yeah, and apparently, apparently 20 pound fluoro isn't heavy enough for him because that's what I broke that one off on. And I don't know if I nicked a rock or something, but oh. yeah. Yeah, I put 25 on the next day. That's the thing, right? Is the whole setup. Like, I've been our buddy Brendan Brown. Um, brown bait co he chimes in on our comments all the time um he's been kind of my resource when i go to about certain things of what rods to throw it there's apparently like a certain setup you need and reel you need for under two ounces and if you go over two ounces and you gotta have a whole nother rod and reel setup for that and it's just like it's just a whole different thing which it's it's fun to learn but i think like everything it it's see it's finding a place amongst avids and tournament fishermen I think for good reason, but it's one of those things where you can't go and live and, and, and die by it, which I mean, depending on the term, right? If you got a one day or maybe a two day, or you can certainly go and live and die by it, especially if they're, they're on it pretty hot, but it's one like in your case, it's one where you have on deck, especially one for practice because it's a great search. Tool. Yeah. To find fish. Oh, that's what I always tell people. It's like, or even in practice, like, in Florida, I picked it up more so just to, like, draw some fish and see how many were on certain places. And then they just started biting it. So it was like a byproduct of that. But 100%, just to see them and find them, yeah, it's it's the deal. But yeah. you'll get someone like Zaldane, like, he's, like, kind of made his whole brand this one bait. And, like, it's probably burned him a lot more than it's helped him, for being yeah, honest. The, the one I think of is the classic at Loudon that he took second in, right, or, like, third or fourth. His top five going in the final day, and he just threw a six and eight inch bag draft the entire time. The first time the classic went to Loudon and Teleco in Knoxville. Mm. Yeah. And yeah. the second like, day he struggled. And then the third, no, I think he caught him the second day, first day, struggled a bit. And then the third day just burned up. He caught like one yeah. fish or two fish all day. Yeah. yeah it, like I feel like that's something you throw when you're capped out, like on four pounders or something. Like you're already doing good, and then you just. You're like, I, I physically don't think I could catch like a seven doing what I'm doing. Then you might go do it, but I don't yeah. know. Yeah. It's definitely one of those things like you pro you're going to have it in the boat regardless because you you might make 10 casts with it during the day. It's one of those 100%. things where you, you got to have it. Like it's, yep. you're going out of a, a pocket and it's got to stretch deep docks or something like that as you're leaving. It's just, it's just one of those where it's a scenario based thing, which like, 100%. Uh, my basically, I was saying, well, uh, we weren't supposed to have glass calm conditions Sunday, but it changed a little bit, obviously. But um, originally, I was gonna be like, I'm just gonna live and die by this thing, be be the the stubborn swim baiter and go and say, I'm just gonna go and shoot for big here. But it's it was, you definitely need to be able to put it down, and that that is the thing you gotta acknowledge. Like, I had one that was old big, just like do the slow like what you want to see in practice when they slowly just follow it out and say hello and just get interested. Yeah. Uh, that's when you got to know, like you got to put it down. Like if it comes out hot on it, it doesn't eat it. Maybe you change color or cadence, but like that's when you got to know, you got to put that sucker down. But I I'm curious from, from your position and expertise. So in my position, throwing that, that cull shad, I was getting a lot of fish that would come up and just rock it and smash the, the cull shad, but wouldn't get it. Like we, you were just talking about, it's a bait that can, make you pretty sad yeah. uh if you if that's happening to you you have enough bunch of fish come up bump the bait not getting it fully what's your first switch whether is it so a what we would do here is i would go throw it in like three pockets and then you catch the ones you catch and then if i had a big follow i'd just like mark the dock or make like a metal waypoint of like where it came out of 
and then I'd let that fish reset, and then I'd come back around and usually just throw a wacky worm or a light shaky head where I saw it, and a lot of times you can catch them like that. So, like, I usually, at least here, it doesn't seem like I can catch them very often on an immediate follow-up, but, like, if you leave, they usually go back to that same spot. So, like, you can throw it, throw it, throw it, and then catch however many you catch on it, and then go right back through those pockets with a wacky and not have to hit you know, all 20 of them, you just go to the few you got followed on. Cause dude, if it's a spot, I don't care if they're two pounds or six pounds, like they're usually going to show them, show themselves on it. So mm -hmm. between that and live scope, you're saving a lot of time for sure. hundred <laughs> percent. But no, no, that that's, that's really all I do with it. If they, if they come out on it and try to eat it and miss it or something, and it may be a fault of mine, but I usually, I'm just so ingrained with like fishing brush and whatnot that like you get your chance and then it's over. Like, I'm going to let them reset and then try to catch them, not go back for them right away. Yeah, that definitely seemed to be the case. I figured out a little bit. I couldn't tell. Is that a normal thing oh, with, yeah. with spots or is that just when they're trying to spawn? No, no, that's a normal thing. But really, <laughs> the only time we throw it here, or at least I do, is March through <laughs> mid, like May. Because <laughs> early, I feel like early season, like when they're still hard free spawn, you get the biggest bites on it. And then right now where they're like pre-spawn, full-blown spawn, post-spawn is when you get like the most bites on it and some big ones. And then post-spawn, you can obviously catch a bunch of those post-spawners, like big skinny ones on it. But my favorite time to throw it's in March before I feel like everyone else picks it up because, dude, we catch – we almost won a really, really big college tournament on it. And we had five bites on it and landed four of them. And they were all over four pounds. And that was on a lake that didn't have very many – you know, that was – that was a big one, yeah. but, but no, it's, uh, I really, I don't throw it in the summer or the fall or anything. I'm at least not around here. Cause it's just, they all kind of get to pretty obvious places. And even if we're catching them on the bank, it's normally something you normally need something a little faster. I feel like to get them to commit. Right. So do you go over that six inch swim bait mark with spots or do you just, I haven't, I haven't, I know you could, I mean, they're so aggressive, dude, a two and a half pounder would probably eat this ankle dad but yeah. but no dude i i haven't i just i'm just i have such a tournament mindset about it and like i think if i was i think if i guided and just fun fish then i'd probably throw the big ones and all kinds of other stuff a lot more but yeah. you know how it is you're always just looking for something that can get you the most bites but also big bites so yeah six six or seven is probably maxed out for me and then i have these hinkles for if i'm in texas or florida or somewhere where i feel like it actually makes sense to throw it <laughs> i feel like i feel like i absolutely love the spirit of a spot like the the mentality they have like i feel like they're you got they're two spots that are sitting under a dock and they see this freaking 10 inch glide bait come past him and he's just looking at his buddy he goes you won't go eat that and he's like bet <laughs> just goes bet <laughs> yeah. dude literally like there there's something else and like I've told you a million times about it, but like you'll, you still haven't, you've never done the top water spotted bass summertime thing. I haven't yet. No. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's when you truly get how stupid or not stupid, but just how aggressive they are. Like, dude, it is unbelievable what they will do to like a big top water bait once they're fired up. Like you'll, you'll throw it over them. There'll be anywhere from five to 50 of them in the school. And if you get one to come up on it, if they're biting, they will literally come fully out of the water, volleyball it, shark it till one gets it. There's nothing. And I've thrown, I've caught them at Champlain on top water. I've caught big largemouth on a buzz bait on the bank. I've, I feel like I've done most of the top water bites and nothing, nothing. Comes He's like, give me that 15 inch spot all day. <laughs> yes. Well, the, the good thing is here, they're normally like three or four pounds. Yeah. So. yeah. <laughs> Those spots in Lanier have been getting big. Like, I feel like it's now you're starting to. It's insane. Of, is it because the Alabamas are starting to get in there and take over? Or they. It's just, no, nobody, everyone has their own theories. I don't think anyone really knows the answer, but the last four years, it's just been getting progressively better and better. And it's almost like, we're seeing the same class of fish. They're just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and they're not dying off or doing anything stupid. And we're just, they're just getting bigger every year and the weights are going up and there's so many fish in the lake. And it's not even that they're necessarily like, I think a lot of people see the weights and they think you just show up and the fishing itself is stupid. It's not the dumbest numbers wise all the time, but the size is what makes it as good as it is. I mean, Dude, it's, it's unreal. Like, we had one this weekend, and given this is 
probably the second biggest bag of spots I've seen weighed in. I didn't fish it, but it took 24 all spots. That's wild. Yeah. So how does like a four and a half pound spot compared to like, say a small mouth in the same weight class. How is the fight compare? So before I went to Champlain, which was my first like true small mouth experience, I was always pissed up there. So yeah. Yeah. I was always told like the small mouth fight harder, but no way they jump more, but they do not fight harder. (laughs) Not in my experience, a four pound spot will, I mean, they, They'll try to die before they give up. Yeah, and, like, you'll get them right to the boat, be sure they're tired, and then they'll just get a whole nother set of life in them and go crazy. (laughs) I would say, Andy, the closest comparison, at least in my limited experience with spots, is, like, river smallmouth. Mm -hmm. It's probably the closest it comes, but I definitely think spots might take the cake when it comes to aggression. Yeah, yeah. If you're talking river fish, those probably fight harder. I've caught a couple shoal bass, and those things are crazy. Like a two and a half pounder feels like a seven pound large mouth. But he's just opening his mouth and sitting in that current as you're trying to fight him, and they just feel massive. And you're like, dang it, it's like a two pounder, dude. I know, I know, but so big. (laughs) But it's funny, like even after the last two or three years, and like. I don't know who wrote that top 100 lakes in Georgia thing for Bassmaster, but they ranked Lanier like fourth. It's got to be, it's probably the fourth best lake in the whole country. And they rated it fourth in Georgia, but it is, it is like, it's just insane. I got no other way to say it. It's, it's unbelievable. It It's definitely, it was on the bucket list, but I think after experiencing Norman spots, it's, it's, definitely numero uno well, right dude, that's like that's like going to watts bar and like <laughs> instead of gunnersville like fair enough not, like, i'm telling you it's <laughs> yeah you you'll if you're ever near it you have to get on it and like hartwell doesn't touch it kiwi doesn't touch it clark's hill doesn't nothing's like it it's its own deal all right game on yeah yeah it's special. it was I, I was pretty bummed we were talking about this whole spotted bass top water thing that was i was literally giggling like a little kid for tournament morning because i didn't i couldn't i didn't have to hold back like obviously in practice and just straight smoke at him first thing on a top water but i was pissed the angle of my gopro i ended up was shifting this way and i was casting that way so you couldn't see it because my big fat head was in the way but i had one come up and eat the top water and then two of them came up and headbutted each other midair, <laughs> jumping at the top water. It was the funniest thing. Uh, Nate, the guy that was sharing the point over, it's like I felt bad for him because he couldn't get anything to go. I think they were all on the right side of the point, nothing on the left. But I'm sitting there yeah. like laughing, half laughing, but half trying to reel this fish in because I'm just watching these. It's like the way the way I relate it to it was like watching those stupid cat videos where you just watch these two fish come out in midair and smoke each other. It's yeah. just yeah, it was a full opinion. Well, dude, and it's oh. like I always tell like clients and stuff. Like you would think it gets old. I promise you. Once June rolls around, and I haven't done it in a few months, and even in October when I've been doing it for six months, every day it amazes me. I'm like, this is just freaking stupid. Yeah, I'm sure you can relate to like the smallmouth guiding. Like people probably think you get. And it's not that you don't every now and then get tired of it. Like you probably have some days where you're like, yeah, this is. You know, I've done this for thirty days in a row now, but it's still. It's still unbelievable. I get tired of fishing deep because it's just a spinning rod. You're chasing. Yeah, that, that would wear me out. That it, wear it, me out. it gets very monotonous, and you're doing the same thing, and it's the same pattern. They kind of move like a little deeper, a little shallower, but you can kind of pattern them out. What I like to do is, I have the Niagara River here that has like three and a half, four mile an hour current, and go pick up a big spook and see if a smallmouth will eat it or go up shallow and throw a spy bait at visual targets. Like that's, that's fun yeah. when I can do that. Can't do it all the time with clients because you know, some of them can't cast or some of them just don't have, can't work the bait the proper way. So you have to adjust through that day. But yeah, it, fishing never gets old. It's just, no. you have to change it up once in a while. Dude, I'll be sitting here in my basement, in my office working and Andy's like, Oh, another day guy. No, <laughs> Deep water fish. I'm like, Andy, shut the hell up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you yeah. could be sitting in this chair right now. But, but uh, I do understand both sides. Yeah, of totally. Good. I, yeah, like there are there are a couple days, and I love guiding. I'd never say I wouldn't want to do it. But there are some days where you're like, gosh, I think I might rather be in an office right now. 
<laughs> no, it, the the goods make up for the bads with it, no doubt. Yeah, yeah. Also, dude, uh, I definitely want to talk about it the the TAA event a little bit yep. here. Um, I will say for people yeah, that want, I gotta take this sweater off. Yeah, yeah, let it rock. Um, for folks that want a full breakdown, uh, I encourage you to go listen to the the BTL. I'm sure you guys did a. I didn't listen to that full one yet because I wanted just to chit chat through this, but. Um, I'm sure you guys no, we a- can probably touch on some stuff we didn't hit. That's typical. We went off on some tangents too, <laughs> but I'm sure you at least did like a general breakdown of yeah. the event and things like that. And don't want to take any thunder away from BTL. Um, so you guys, if you haven't listened to that one, I encourage you to, but, um, coming out of it, out of this event, where do you see one, the potential for it to go? And what was, would you say from your experience, the, the overall, like how it was put on, uh, your overall experience of the event? Yep. So coming out of it, dude, it was like everybody at that tournament was in a good mood. It was ran really well. Like it was just a good tournament. Like that is the best way to put it. Like it was, everyone got their checks. The weigh in was good. Um, Like nobody was, what's a good word for it? I guess just bitching about forward facing sonar the whole time. And like, you know, it was, it was just fun. And, uh, dude, he, the guy running it, Alan, he's, he legitimately just wants, like, he has his own business and does really well for himself. So he, that thing is registered as a nonprofit and he's only doing it for the anglers. Like, he spent a bunch of his own money, like, had a bunch of staff there, like, spent, like, a bunch of money on these devices that go around the scope and like you know how much it costs to run a big tournament like that and still pretty much gave us a 100 percent payout and i know he said that any sponsor money he's getting in the future is going directly into the payout so it is i mean it's a good deal and he has no intentions to let up he's not trying to like compete with bass or mlf he just wants like another supplementary trail for people to fish and uh (laughs) You know, I think the future he's going to do one day of practice. So that sounds crappy on the surface because you're like, I'm not going to be able to figure anything out. But if nobody else has those days of practice, what does it matter? So you're saving yourself. You know, I don't have a family, but a bunch of those guys do. So, like, they're saving themselves a bunch of time away from the house. Or if you're missing time off your regular day job, plus the cost of gas, boat depreciation, everything else that go into an extra four or five, six, two weeks of practice if there's no cutoff. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, dude, it was sweet. Other than that, it was pretty much just the standard five fish limit. There was no live scope, no 360, no waypoints. All we got was a ride around before. And, uh, it was weird at first. I'm not going to lie. I still caught all mine pretty much offshore. Like some of them were like way offshore and it was, it was weird. You got really excited when you got a bite. Whereas nowadays we pretty much know when it's coming. That yeah. is one thing. And I am not even close to, a live scope hater. I love it, but we don't get as excited about bites as we used to anymore. And in that tournament, when I got bit, it was like, you got that, like, you know, your heart stopped for a second. And then, yeah. What just happened? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it was, it was really, um, I guess satisfying to go back and like, I fish way more of a pattern than I normally would have. I think with scope, I usually run this time of year, a lot more just spots where you pull up, you know, see if they're there catch a few and leave this one it was like yeah it was just it was a whole different mindset but dude it was really fun like everybody who was there had positive feedback even the guys who didn't get checks and clearly they blasted them i mean it wasn't it sucks for me because and i'm not complaining in the slightest but like the entire top 12 me jeff gustafson kaz anderson and joey sifuentes we were the only ones fishing for them and we had spotted bass, but I think I don't want to say that because I'm sure some of the other guys weighed some just fishing. I know David Williams caught a bunch of his just fishing, but the predominant of that weight in the top 12 was bed fishing, which, you know, isn't a whole lot better than anything else, in my opinion. But it was really fun. Right. And he's got he's got the plan to uh, to do more of them. And I'm going to I'm planning on being there for sure. Yeah, I heard um, I think it was Trey. Del Dane on Twitter was saying that he it's not official yet, but the, there sounds like they're trying to do one in, in the fall, which could be yep. pretty cool. I don't know if it's the same lake or whatnot. No, but. no, he's going to go to some different places. I think he wants to come back to Lanier next year just because it's such a good lake. And I, that's part of the reason I think everyone was having, like, if you had 16 a day, 
you got like I don't know, probably twenty fifth or thirtieth. Yeah, I mean, real for a so spot it's like you could still sure. go and have a great day, and <clears throat> I mean, losing five grand does suck. I'd be in, a, I'd probably be in a pretty bad mood, but <laughs> yeah. But, but uh, still, I, I, I hope that one more anglers will get involved in it. Uh, the next coming events and moving forward, um, especially well, he, he had, to yeah, the he guys, had a bunch that, of signups and just people right. who bailed last minute, and <laughs> uh, it really could have been a two hundred boat event, but. I think people were scared to throw five grand at something that they'd never even seen happen before. So this was you know, probably as much of a proof of concept as anything else, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, and I totally get that side. Like I saw, of course the people in comments are going to be people in the comments are going to be the keyboard warriors, but um, they're like, Oh, I don't see so-and-so it's been complaining about it showing up for this event. Well, it's like, that's a lot of money, to money. Throw something that you don't know how it's going to be run. Like I, I would probably be in the side of caution too. Or like, I'm just going to let the first one ride and just see how it yeah. goes. You know, it's, it's like, it a, weird, a new like they're like, yeah, I'm let you back know, first, you yeah, know? the guy who runs it, Alan, like he's an awesome guy. But like, at first I was like, I'm just wiring five grand to this guy for all I know, he could be throwing it in a bank account and this tournament's never going to happen. But <laughs> ghost everybody. <laughs> like, yeah. There's retirement. <laughs> Yeah, it'd be like oh. the most famous ghost of all time. But uh but no, it was it was a, uh, it was fun. And I it'd be cool to go somewhere super random for one too, like somewhere nobody's got any history too. Mm. I mean that'd be a lot of fun, but yeah, that the way meme, I look at that freaking this... that meme or whatever you guys made the video, that I think like four hundred people sent that to me, so I appreciate that. <laughs> I'm sure we. I think that thing almost has up to a thousand shares, which is Dude. pretty wild. Yeah, but we had some people going like they were. I know some people. Some people took that way too seriously. I and I wasn't gonna get involved because like it was literally pointing at me in it. So I was like, I'm just gonna watch. <laughs> So but, that's the best part is so I didn't intentionally do that. It just so happened that the the meme, whatever that I made on it, pointed at you, but I didn't notice oh. it until someone told me that. I'm, I was just looking at it. I'm like, okay, I, I see, thought you planned this. it like that because literally the guy's hand goes like under my name. And I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> I didn't like, notice I saw it. You po- I saw you posted it. And I was like, this is great, but I'm, this is about to go sideways. And sure enough, all the cops, yeah. like, <laughs> but it was, I mean, it was funny. It was hilarious. But uh, yeah, yeah, like, dude, we had some people commenting on it, like Caleb Summerall commenting on it. And he, he can take it. To, he gets the joke, but he, he definitely pokes fun at it. Uh, and that's like we're all we can we can handle a joke we can yeah. we can handle some some fun hate, but uh, there were some people though that you could tell were like they were pissed off. I know, like I swear, some just, people, guys, this is all joke. Yeah. Like this is all yeah. fun. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Some but, people don't don't know how to recognize humor, especially in today's day and age. Oh, everyone's man. so dude in the fishing right. world. It's like everyone's just so pissed. Yeah. Well, so th- here's the thing, and this is this is the last thing negative I will say. Uh, on the show, or at least about the event. I think this event was incredible. I love it. Uh, and I actually have some ideas that I've been talking with some guys with, and I definitely want to run by you for either the next one or if there's one next year um, that I love to do with Serious Angler. But the one thing I I was – I more found comical, and I shouldn't say negative, was the amount of people are like – uh, they're like, yeah, four face sonar sucks. Now stop going to events that headed on spawn. Like you wanted an event with no forward, and you're still dude, don't even get me. I couldn't agree more. It's <laughs> dude, those people who leave those comments and stuff, they will never be happy. The next one, it'll be, oh, you had to go to a smallmouth event where guys were out in the middle anyway. It's like those kind of people, dude. They, nah, you just just let them be. Yeah, then it'll be. Of course, you went to Gunnersville when the punching bites on. Go to when it's hard, and it's like right, right. What no, it's, you, want? Dude, you like, literally cannot. You cannot please make those, those people happy. happy. No, and it's you like, just gotta ignore it. We got that's some why, people. Like, yeah, and I mean this honest to go, like. Obviously, it's hard not to get into the conversations about everything right now, but like at the end of the day, like you're not hearing that stuff from guys generally speaking who are in all these tournaments. It's from these random people, like that you never hear about just in comments on probably some dude on his couch who doesn't even fish very often. So it's like, yep. I don't know, from my point of view, it's like, I just fish and don't really worry about the rest. Of yeah. It. Like, yeah. It's- For the most part, I ignore all of it. It's more like, cause we have some guys on here that I- I've recognized the name that only ever come in here and comment negative stuff. Never. It's never any positive glimpse, which I, I hate when not trying to look at some positive situation, but it's when they start attacking anglers for this stuff that are like friends of, of the show, friends of mine that yeah. are, I know are really, really good people. 
that that one I, that's like almost like the the not calling but, myself a big brother of the anglers but like that mentality comes out where it's like god it's like i tried to resist so hard to comment back to some of these people right and they and like there is genuinely like people out there that like they just think that that stuff's easy i'm like you don't even it's like you have to go so far down a rabbit hole and work so hard just to do like decent yeah. at these events and like there's people online and think it's like the easiest easy, thing ever well yeah, yeah well, what you do you can't make those people happy or change their mind so yeah and it's i'm sure you're hearing all of it because one it's you're you're wicked with floor facing you're wicked without it but also lanier was your home lake and you're in the one of the youngsters <laughs> it's, you had the yeah. full gauntlet and dude, i will say there was a lot of there was a lot of pressure in the sense going into it because i was like damn if i don't catch them in this one i am kind of gonna look like an idiot <laughs> just home lake and everything yeah. Yeah, but i mean yeah, but... home lake is a place that like crushes not crushes like anglers from the home lake but it yeah time over time the home lake guy not just feeling pressure they just they usually do really good or really bad yeah it's yeah. one or the other top five or bust and yeah, yeah. that yeah. was one thing i actually had a really good conversation there was a guy that uh, was just talking about some negatives and there's some people out there that actually really appreciate that um, take it out of the comments so DM and we can have like a mature constructive conversation about it but there was one guy who was like of course like it's home lake you know you got these guides out there well yeah but like look at this year Jason Christie on Grand Lake and Leo Livesey on Fork everybody put all the pressure on them and yeah like, dude, I, like, tell, I tell people all the time like Hartwell is only a semi home lake for me like I get to go there maybe 30 times a year that's days not like separate trips but like i go there a decent bit but like i would take a tournament on there or clark's hill or something like that usually anytime over lanier because lanier dude it gets to a point where like you've caught a five pounder on just about every point and hump in the lake and you have too much it's really really hard to look at it with like a fresh mindset and being able to figure out like what's going on that day because you're so stuck on all your options. Whereas when you go somewhere that you you're comfortable with, but it's still not like, you know, it like the back of your hand, you can figure out like, you get what I'm saying? Like the little things that are going on that day or that week, whereas it's so easy to overlook that stuff somewhere that you've just seen too much like linear. So I was history helped me in that one, but it, uh, God, it can bite you too. Like dude, the second day, I had zero bass, not a 14 inch at 11 o'clock. Oh. Yeah. Cause the first day I caught them all on a shaky head, um, on these shallow points that like usually the spots spawn on and stuff or like little rock piles and whatnot. And I'd done it and it just, dude, it was just not working. I don't know if I just wasn't holding my hat right or what, but, and then I did a total 180 and went and fished a herring spawn on some seawalls and it was like unbelievable. That's awesome. But, it was a uh, dude. It was fun. Seriously, I think you could ask almost anyone that was there, and they say the same thing. Yeah, it, it looks like a heck of a time. Um, I saw like uh, I would love to see more coverage around it, which is definitely one of the things I want to talk to you about later. But like, yeah. so I saw Bass Three Sixty Five went down. He did a good job covering it. But like, it just looked like a really fun event. To not not saying that the current formats are bad, but it it's a breath of fresh air. I think for some folks. Yeah, uh, and what it really reminded me of was, and we've talked about it countless times in the show, like MLF with their cup format. That was the best thing I think they've ever done. I think they really were the big miss that they had was not making those live and making that yep. their format, which I think you have here, which is like you show up to a lake and at most you get four hours of ride around and that's it. Then you go and yep. fish for three days. A hundred percent. And the so the coverage thing is tricky, right? Because you'd have to find a way to do coverage without that. Like he is, again, he's not a tournament organization for profit. So yeah. you'd have to find a way to provide really good coverage without it costing. I mean, live coverage, I can't imagine how much that would cost, but. Well, that's where I think people like us need to step forward and try to help. Like I know Joyce Fuentes went live on his Facebook page. This right, is time right. for anglers yeah. to really present themselves and brand themselves in places like this to make themselves yeah. one more worthy to their sponsors, but two to bring more attention to themselves. Cause like, I mean, it kind of gives you like on the flip side, I love that this guy's just got the intentions of, I want to provide a great event for the anglers about the anglers, come in, have fun, compete for big money and allows anglers one to 
you can choose like, oh, I want to go watch Brandon Polnick fish, or I want to watch a meal fish. That would watch be sweet. Joey fish. Yeah. But it's, uh, I mean, I guess I'll just I'll throw it out there. I was trying to just keep it a little bit hush, but I'm sure some people are trying to do it. I would love to live stream one to three anglers on Serious Angler for the next tournament. Like, yeah, get us down sure. there, get us in their boats, and live stream for you guys. Yeah. Like, it just it'd be a cool way of getting coverage, but also, um for the event itself like i i don't see why it, it's it's probably a no-brainer for him like to bring yeah, in these because out. he doesn't have to do the work or pay the money to get it and y'all get the benefits of that yeah. added audience on your channel yeah that's a win-win exactly. yeah and it, it'd sure. be like it's for the angler like you're live on somebody's show you're getting the attention like i, I would love to see this become a thing where it's like jay kumar at bass blaster goes you get you know bass 365s there you get a bunch of the you know wire to fish whomever but like it'd be cool to see all that forefront of fishing media come forward and uh, for the anglers for the trail, it, it could really be a cool spectacle. Is what a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I think too, like it'd be cool if this thing took off to where there was four or five events a year, and it was just like a supplementary trail to if you miss the opens or the elites or the Bass Pro Tour. Because if I could, I do get it. Like some of those guys, like their style really just doesn't cater towards fishing offshore or using live scope or whatever. And it is, it is just a super dominant technique right now. Mm -hmm. So I do understand the argument that there needs to be room for both. I don't think, you know, one needs to be banned or whatever, right. but I totally get that some people would want to fish a tournament where you don't have to think about it the whole tournament. So, yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's a cool, uh, we said breath, breath of fresh air, but also just a different thing that people aren't seeing right now. Right, yeah, right. And it's like, crazy. I was thinking about it. It's yeah. like now I I pretty much always look for a way to catch them offshore when you go somewhere. But if you know that you can't use scope or 360, even if you could use 360, you'd still be chilling because you could line up on your brush and all that stuff really nicely. But right. when you don't have any of that, it's like you start looking for options you normally wouldn't look for before. So I don't know. I get it. That's cool. Yeah. No, and it, directly when it was going on, uh, you know, we were talking about it earlier. I was in a different, granted, obviously it's from the kayak, but didn't have any of the electronics on it. And it felt really good to just not look yeah. down at a screen and just go fish. Cause yeah. it was, it's definitely a whole different mindset, but yeah. um, either way, um, that's really cool. I definitely want to talk more about that whole coverage stuff with you later, but um, yeah, I can put you in touch with Alan. I know he's still like, he still hasn't even gotten to where he knows where the second tournament is or anything, but hundred percent, I'm sure he'd be all in on that. Yeah. We, we got his contact and actually uh, it's going to be an upcoming business for the bass boat show. It's going to be pretty cool. Oh, heck yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, we definitely want to be pretty actively involved in that. And um, it's freaking awesome. But before we let you go here, um, cause we got our upcoming guests about to jump on here in a little bit. Um, how you feeling about your open season thus far and, the remainder of what's to come for 2024. Yep. Yeah. I was, I was feeling really good after the first two events. Um, I think I was like seventh in the points or something. And then Santee Cooper happened and that was not pretty. That was by far the worst tournament I've ever had. And uh, dude, like I, I've told buddies and stuff, like I legit could have like cried going away in that first day. Like I, it's just like you work so hard and then to have two fish on Santee Cooper in March, it was, it was a tough pill to swallow, but I left the event thinking I was out of it. And then I looked at the points and stuff and it's, it's still super doable. So I feel good about it in the sense that I guess I'm a little less stressed now than I was after the first two, but I, I think I need, I don't know. I'm not a big math guy when it comes to the tournaments, but probably a few top twenties and then not another one below 50th. And I think, you know, I'd still be, still be pretty dang close. And, uh, Logan Martin, I think Lay Lake helped me a lot for that one, being there for Red Crest and everything. I learned a lot about how the Coosa sets up and how those river fish set up. And uh, I think the only one that's a really big curveball in my head is going to be Mississippi River and Leech Lake. More so Mississippi River. I don't know. I just feel like that'll be a weird one. Yeah, I feel like you can have 12, and then another guy will have 13 and a half both days, and he's 50 spots above you. So. <laughs> The goal, yeah, the goal is just to, I mean, obviously still try to make the elites the rest of the year, but also just learn a bunch. I mean, I was telling Matt, I don't know if they did it on purpose, but I literally don't think you could create a more diverse schedule than what they came out with this year. I mean, 
it doesn't matter about what what your strength is like yeah you are not going to be able to do it at even 80 percent of the events like it is all over the place you have a florida event then we go to wachita which was kind of a deep clear water event but they ended up catching them in the grass then you have santee cooper they were all spawning on the bank which is what screwed me up i should have seen that coming and then you have logan martin which is a total river system then you go to uh freaking you follow oklahoma that's like the biggest gar hole in the world from what i've heard and it just it's just a grinder of a tournament and then st Clair, that's just straightforward smallmouth fishing i'm sure yeah and then like i said mississippi river you have wing dams grass smallmouth everything leech lake there's never even been a bass event on i mean nobody has any history there that part of it's like straight smallmouth deep bowl and then there's like largemouth grass fishing as far as the eye can see and then we ended on a herring lake, which is offshore fishing, but it's totally its own thing. So, I mean, it's if you make it this year, you deserved it for sure. But yeah. I wonder I'm how many a, Midwest guys are just are trying to jackpot that specific leech. division because <laughs> it's just like is that one like do a lot of people fish that place? Like, do they have big local tournaments and stuff? Leech, Up yeah. there, yeah, yeah. I didn't even know that. Yeah, it's we got a few buddies up that way that. They get it's some big Easton's home lake, so I'm sure he's pressure's there. on. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, that's that's got to be huge, especially when it's one thing. Like, yeah, I love Hartwell, but a bunch of people have been to Hartwell. It's like when it's your home lake, and literally nobody else has been there. Like, that's got to be a good feeling. But yeah, because it definitely is out of the way for a lot of you Southern guys. That it's not like a quick trip to go pre fish type of deal or check it out. It's not something yeah. that's on the way to another event either. But yeah, I'm, actually, I'm going to uh, I'm going to Logan Martin in the morning. I uh, I'm gonna go check it out before the cutoff Sunday. I think so. I'm gonna go look at it for two days. It's only like two hours from the house, and I've never really been there. So, gonna go check that out, and then go fish a BFL on Hartwell on Saturday, and then guide for two weeks and head to Logan for the next one. But there, it's a uh, they're different. I don't know. It's it's not like the Toyotas and whatnot. It's, you put a lot more pressure on yourself because everyone is so important, but yeah, they're fun. I'll be doing them next year if I don't make it. So <laughs> awesome. Thank you, yeah, man. Well, you're just, you're staying fishy. I think that's the most important thing. So. Yep. Yeah. What do y'all have coming up? Oh man. Um, Andy's obviously got guiding. Yeah. Working. Uh, nothing big tournament wise. <laughs> oh, <laughs> man, what a life we have guiding working <laughs> well, this is why we have you on emil because we're not we don't, we don't live exciting lives <laughs> oh my god whatever i look at smallmouth on forward facing and tell people where to cast it's yeah it's like, that that would be uh <laughs> that would be tough yeah but no you guys yeah you'll have to move down south and come get a taste of it yeah we're thinking well i didn't say we yeah bailey's thinking i'm i'm probably not going anywhere so <laughs> yeah either way we'll be we'll be in touch emil and seriously always appreciate you taking time to to jump on this show again encourage people to go listen to the btl um you guys did i'm sure a full more breakdown of the taa event itself but um man always fun and uh i'm sure we'll have many tangents coming up when we get you back on here absolutely i'm always down appreciate <laughs> it guys thank you yeah, buddy safe travels tomorrow yeah see you there you go emil wagner uh, always a treat getting them on here, but uh, dude, really quick, talking about that that youth movement. I mean, yeah, well, yeah, talking about youth movement, we're gonna be having two dang hammers coming up here soon. We got Tyler Corey and Scott Sledge, which is yeah, we've been keeping them waiting for I think almost a half hour. Yeah, I think guys. I texted Tyler like 30 minutes ago. I was like, Yeah, 10 minutes, buddy, we're gonna bring you on. <laughs> it's, been, it's been a good half hour, 45 yeah. minutes at least. Uh, uh, we can't be trusted, but no, no I'm not like. <laughs> Here's the thing. Yes, we have all this stuff accessible, but like when you listen to, I think, Emil, you can put in that bucket of the, the youth movement, right? You have, he's grinding out guiding every single day. He's taking the time and effort he's to go the water. refish these places. It, it's just, I, I think we live in an age where one, uh, these, I think you have, not saying that generations before haven't, had that grind, but they're finding out a way to grind in different uh, avenues than have existed in previous generations where it's, yeah, you could be on the water every day, but it's they're in a different fashion. You're guiding or you're going to pre-fish. You're probably not driving all over the country to check out lakes. 
you know, 20, 30 years ago, like the guys are doing now where they have avenues like with sponsors and things like that, that can afford to pay that, you know, for them to go and, and do such a thing. But um, I, I just, again, that's one thing I want to throw out there because it's a straight effort thing. And it's impressive to see some of these young guys, you know, in the, the absolute straight knockdown drag out, not sleeping uh, and the, the effort that they put forth to, to make these dreams happen. Um, which by the way, with that, like, that's one thing I've seen with Kyle Patrick, you know, on the elite series that we've gotten to see a glimpse of. Uh, and I got to give him a kudos for his YouTube series. He's dropped his classic video. Uh, he's doing his YouTube stuff. Unlike any other pro is, and it's absolutely, he's bringing his Tyler, or not Tyler, good grief, his Kyle uh, humor into it. But also the, the style fashion of editing is, is, is Bravo. Uh, anybody that hasn't watched it, I encourage you to, uh, <laughs> It's just it's Kyle being Kyle, so you, you'll thoroughly enjoy Kyle! it. Kyle, <laughs> dude, just like one scene of cuts to of him taking a piss off the boat, and he's like, huh, "I'm peeing on my jig. I wonder if they'll eat it." Like it's just <laughs> Kyle being Kyle, and then he oh goes to proceed to catch a four pounder. So it's I'm uh, jig. Oh yeah. man, that's gonna be the next hot thing. Kyle urine. <laughs> yeah, I don't even want to go down that. <laughs> but either way thank you again to emil for for hopping on the show definitely want to make him a consistent one and uh i think we'll have to get him on for the uh each open kind of get a little recap but uh with that being said we got tyler and scott coming up here and uh with a quick message from x2 power in the world of battery power a word to the wise Compromise elsewhere. All right, and we are back, and we're back with part two. We're going to bring on two young hammers from the college ranks, University of Montevallo, won the old college, uh, the college deal on the classic weekend. So let's bring them in here without further ado. We got Mr. Tyler Corey and Scott Sledge. What's going on, fellas? Up, what up? How are you guys? Sorry to make you wait so long. <laughs> no, that's all right. That was good stuff. Emil was on a tangent. And I love it. Yeah. That, that's that's all the show is. Yeah. Rabbit holes. <laughs> Which, speaking of rabbit holes, dude, Scott, I think you have to be in the bucket, like top five coolest names in fishing right now. Me? Yeah, Sledge just sounds badass, dude. I, just I always get told it sounds like an old like rock star from like the 80s and 70s, and I should have big, big poofy hairspray hair or whatever. Yeah, but... and a mustache, man. Like, oh, my mom out. hates it. She's watching the podcast right now. She hates this thing. <laughs> Wait, is that a, is that a mullet going too? You got a mullet going? Me? Uh, back there? I don't really know what that. it is. I don't have any. Of oh, yeah. That, that's basically. Oh, dude, you, yeah, you, got, you, got. No, you, you know what you got? You got the hockey, uh, the hockey mullet where it's the, the bad hairline and then you got the lettuce He's flowing out the, the back. back. Yeah, that's yeah. what I went for. Yeah. I figured, like, I don't know, three, four years, I won't have hair anymore. So just grow it out while I can. Buddy, I, I'm I'm right with you. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a hockey thing. It's the two things that I've seen. Uh, which actually, this is an interesting conversation. I haven't seen this with football players, but hockey players and anglers, horrible hairlines at such a young age because of helmets and we all wear hats. I don't know what it is. That's why Chad Pipkins has the greatest hair on the tour because he never wears a damn hat. He never wears a hat. <laughs> Even Skeet, he used to wear that visor and he's, he's impeccable still. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, well boys, uh, First thing I want to get into is one congratulations on Classic Weekend. That's thank you. Cool. Absolutely love the picture of Tyler's face, just full on <laughs> screaming with the trophy. That's that yeah, was pretty high. <laughs> I can imagine. So, kind of give us a lay down because the one thing I do love Classic Weekend, but the one thing that I would say, if there's anything I'd love to improve about it, is put some more buzz around you guys on stage as well as the the kayak guys on stage. So for people that might not have seen it or gotten overlooked by the mass amount of classic coverage, kind of give a, a breakdown of what event you were fishing and what was all in it that you guys are competing for. Right. So it was the Bassmaster College Classic. It's basically a one-off exhibition type tournament to showcase the 
high finishers from last year. So it was the top two from all four of the regular season college events, and then the top two from the national championship and the top two in the team of the year. And we were second in team of the year last year, right behind Easton, but everybody got an invite. So all 12 and then nine ended up showing up and we were on Keystone Lake on Sunday of the classic from seven to two we were doing. And what, how did the, from the tournament itself, what'd you guys win with? Like what were the weights like? We had 22 even. Our teammates came in second, Nick Dumpke and James Willoughby with 18, 14 or something. And then there was a 16 and another 15 in there. The weights were pretty good. The lake kind of fired that day. It was pretty decent in practice, but not not that good. Yeah, I remember because you came over to the X2 booth for a little bit. We were chit-chatting. You're like, I kind of got a feel about something. You're kind of a little well under the radar about it. But the next thing you know, I see you guys. I'm in the media room. And I see you hold up the stage. I'm like, oh. I was just talking to that kid. <laughs> it worked out perfect for you, boys. Yeah, but, uh, we were getting a couple a couple pretty big bites. We got two days of practice, and we were getting a couple nice bites every day and some pretty consistent, kind of had a pattern figured out and caught one, like, right at six pounds on a mag draft the last day of practice, and then that was pretty much it. We went in. We were like, we pretty much found all we can possibly find for a one-day derb, and if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And we got fortunate enough where it was just one of those days on Sunday that, that wind kicked up and everything that we'd found that was decent or good just got better. And everything that we swung on that day was just big. I don't know that we ain't never seen anything like it in all of our college tournaments. So yeah, how are you guys catching them if you're willing great. to divulge? Yeah, we, uh, we caught them jerking uh, vision 110 and a half ounce war Eagle spinner bait, just crawl on the bottom with it. They're on like channel swing main, like the first big swing coming into the, creeks on that pond anywhere that you had that good bluff transition there's a lot of big bluff walls out there that you'd get a decent little like pea gravel kind of shelf rock transition before it got to the big flat where they'd spawn and that's that's where they were it got a little colder the our off day on saturday when the high schoolers were out there and that kind of killed the mag draft bite that we had going on but didn't move them much it kind of backed them off onto the actual bluffs and i think it just made it better it was just Every fish in the lake was on those little swings, and it showed on tournament day. I yeah, obviously twenty two pounds. I mean, that's a damn damn bag. Twist my arm the way you guys are catching them. You weren't having any fun. No, not at all. <laughs> not even a little bit. So, uh, so Scott, were you were you guys given? Uh, obviously, Easton's fishing the classic, so you couldn't really you know poke any fun at him, but. So where was all the uh, the poke and the fun, the bragging rights going at Nick then <laughs> because he he finished second to you boys. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, would you say so? I would say so. Yeah, yeah it's, it was... I don't know, it's just always been kind of a friendly rivalry between us two. We've usually, us both, all four, four of, of us, us being from up north, like, we didn't know each other really in high school, and then we all showed up here, and we were like, damn, we're all from pretty close from home, and I don't know, we've all just kind of grown up together here, so to get, to get one over on those guys felt good, but they've got <laughs> two dozen to one at this point. Hey. Take your wins where you can get them. <laughs> That's we'll what we're saying. Absolutely. You guys, uh, I mean, program-wise, it's damn impressive. Um, and obviously, I, I knew about Montevallo and Bethel and things like that, you know, going into or just from for, for, from following fishing. But um, really, when I got a glimpse of the kind of characters that your program is churning out, was actually when I got to meet Nick probably – two summers ago now because he obviously works for wired to fish uh and just seeing work ethic but also how much he actually knew about fishing and then when i got to learn oh he, he college he fishes in college for montevallo and i'm like oh damn this is the kind of people you guys are turning out over there so w what is that environment like for you guys and you talked about friendly rivalry but like what is the day in day outlook for you likely for you guys yeah, uh, the first thing that makes it super easy that I know everyone asks, like, how do you guys leave for weeks on end? Our professors around here, for one, get what fishing is being located in central Alabama. A lot of them might not like fish on the weekends or anything, but at least they know what we're doing. So that mm -hmm. helps a ton. They're super flexible. And then the environment that our coach has created around here that just like it's that iron sharpens iron type mentality where either you compete and get better or you get left by the wayside around here and that's what's 
created such an environment around here that's just trophies everywhere and I don't know, way more accolades than I figured it was possible to collect in a four-year period of being here. Yeah, is is there any, like, sneaking around with each other, knowing that you guys might see, uh, see each other in the opens or things like that later on? I think there's a little bit of that. I don't know. It's just nice to have so many like-minded people around here. Like, if we ever did want to go to fish the opens, like, chances are someone from this university that we've fished with is going to want to do it, too, so... We got some running baits and I don't know. It's just such a melting pot too. Like Scott's from Indiana. I'm from Wisconsin. We got obviously Easton and Nick from Minnesota, some other guys from Minnesota, but we got dudes from California. We got dudes from Texas. We got dudes from here in Alabama. Like it's just a giant melting pot of like specialties and techniques and stuff that when it all comes here to the same little town in central Alabama, it just works. I don't know. Yeah. So I guess I'm I'm curious. We'll start with Scott and move over to you, Tyler. Is what is one is the biggest what is what is the biggest thing that you have learned from out of fishing in college that you wouldn't have if you didn't sign up for the the program? Oh uh, I guess that you really you just have to catch them because the college guys catch them the best. It kind of teaches you what to do to where you like don't really like crap out in a tournament. You just have to learn to I don't know, be consistent and consistency is going to get you farther. And I guess that's the biggest thing I've learned so far in college is just being consistent. And that has gotten us farther as a team more than anything. I got you. Yeah. And so not like always being out there looking for the the biggest sack in the lake, but how to survive and make that the top 20s, top 10s. Yes. Like we, of course we want to win, but we kind of have our position on the team. We're not the big swingers. We're kind of, we're both bigger guys. We're, we're the linemen of the team. We do the dirty work. And like, <laughs> hey, everyone, I've seen Tyler. That boy is a damn lineman. I'll tell you what. <laughs> <laughs> so we kind of just like protect, we protect everyone. And like, we have our couple guys that you always see them towards the top of the leaderboard. But if you go back just a little bit, that's kind of where we are. We're kind of point blockers almost, you could say. All right. I got you. Tyler, what about you, man? Yeah, kind of the same thing is just how to grind and how to survive, how to deal with that much pressure because we don't fish many college tournaments that aren't capped out at 250 boats. So just coming from up north where a lot of our tournaments are 30, 40, 50 boats maybe, like the first 250 boat blast off I ever seen, I was a little shell shocked. And then just learning how to deal with that and stuff and being able to like grind to get to 12 or 13 pounds and survive to fish another day is something that we, I would have never learned without college. And then just being able to, cons- like he said, consistently put up decent finishes and then be able to see when you have that opportunity to pop off and win one. Yeah. I mean, the dynamic, I, I've heard a lot of guys talk about the college ranks and the open ranks, like compared to now that when they're on tour, things like that and the competitiveness, competitiveness of it uh, and how it just keeps getting better. I mean, look, we, we saw Easton, we got what 17th or something like that in the classic against some of the best in the world that speaks volumes Yeah. Again, on what the, the college programs you guys are in are putting out. Um, so it's, it's damn impressive. And it's really setting you guys up for, I think exactly what like say Bassmaster is trying to do with the nine opens. Um, is that something you guys, is that your next step? Will you guys know yet if that's the, the jump you're going to make? I mean, I would like to personally, I'd like to do it, but at the same time, I want to graduate. I want to get a job and get kind of a foundation set before I chase anything. I kind of, I just don't want to go into debt right out of it and kind of be, well, I tried it for two years. I'd rather save up some money and go at it for like three or four years. So are you saying that because mom's watching or you say, is that- <laughs> no, no. <laughs> my mom knows that. that's what I've always, that's what I've pretty much always said. I knew I didn't want to chase it. I don't feel like I'm ready fresh out of college. I would want to get some more experience out, fish some bigger tournaments and just kind of dabble around and then take the leap. I, I think that would make you a very smart man if you, if you did it that way. Uh, but as a fan, a fan of the sport, all I got to say is I just want to see some open coverage with the big sledge on the back of a jersey. I just got to see it happen at least once. <laughs> Let's see what we yeah, can do. Sledge what we can do. Like a hammer, like vinyl wrap, right? And just put a like, hammer wrapped on the boat. Yeah, he needs yeah. like a Stanley sponsorship or something. Like, what's <laughs> yeah. the hardware? Harbor Freight, maybe. Oh, yeah. 
be fired. Yeah, that be... <laughs> in the front, your, your name on the jersey, it's just Scott the Sledge. Yeah. <laughs> the sledge. <laughs> That's all. But Tyler, what about you, man? Are you is the open? Is that the plan? Yeah, I I'm engaged right now. I'm gonna try and get everything settled as far as starting a family and stuff, and then go for the leap whenever we see fit. I'm a I'm a big believer that everything happens for a reason. And if it's supposed to go that way, it will, I'm going to do everything in my power to work towards that, but I'm not going to put me or my fiance in any sort of dire financial situation, trying to chase something that I'm probably not ready for straight out of college. Yeah. Well, one Bravo to run while you can. Uh, yeah. I, think that's, I think that's the every married man joke I'm supposed to make now that I'm married, but uh, I feel like we're obligated, Andy, now to say these things. I don't, I don't know. I'm still getting used to the married life. How, was but, it like shake the head no, but say yes? No, was it say no and then shake the head yes? Like run. No, honey, I didn't order that tackle. That didn't yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I have no yeah. idea what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. For real, uh, congrats on that. Um, Thank you. Smart on your part to obviously get the foundation going, which uh, leads me to the question because – I think everybody, I mean, heard multiple people talk about it. Um, if you guys listen to Mercer's podcast, he talked about it with Hamner, but he talked about how he literally was scrounging for change under the seat of his truck to make it happen. So from your guys' perspective, where eventually you want to make that jump or at least try, but you have the, the wits about you to do it in an intelligent way. How does a testimonial like that from Hamner, where he's doing by any means necessary, does that conflict with you guys at all personality wise does it ever come upon you in your noggin where you're like man screw it we should just make the jump like that's got to be kind of conflicting when you see these guys like justin hamner that get it done that fashion you you see countless stories like that that's got to be kind of somewhat conflicting for you guys that are going through the ranks right now yeah i would say definitely it is yeah it's something that we all think about it i've had the thought before that i would live in the back of my truck and just travel around and fish but at the same time i don't really i wouldn't really want to live like that for that long very long so especially so that's just me personally that's just me yeah no that's smart smart and it's uh, it's tough for us right now because like we've been engulfed in this college fishing thing for like four years now fishing like i don't know i think last year we fished like 15 or 16 17 college tournaments and so it's like every other weekend for us. So it's easy to say right now, like, yeah, you know, we'll take some time off and maybe make the transition later. But there's a good chance that we may get out of this thing and be like, dude, we're so freaking addicted to tournament fishing that we can't not. There's no other option. So it's tough to say until after we graduate and kind of space ourselves away from this incredibly competitive environment that we're in right now. But I don't know if it's something that, the op the, if the opportunity came tomorrow and it gave me like full ride entry fees paid like let's go i'm hopping on it like i'm sure everybody else would but to find that opportunity in this industry is difficult so hoping to take the next couple of years and maybe find that golden ticket yeah so with that we i got some fun questions lined up but mm -hmm. before we do uh i definitely want to give a nod to you guys doing it the right way being smart about it so with that, what what are your guys' degrees? And like, what's the, obviously there's the fishing dream, but what do you guys want to do? Like, what do you want to do with your degree? So I am getting my degree in marketing, like most guys fishing in college. And I'd love to stay in the fishing industry. Like that's been my dream since I was a kid is to either fish professionally. And if I can't engulf myself as close to it through my job as I can. So don't have anything lined up right now looking obviously it's a small industry you got to know people to get in but i'm interning up at bassmaster right now in their um, magazine editorial department so james has been a big help for me and brianne trying to get me pointed in the right direction at least to find a job within the industry but that's that is the the goal if we can't make it professionally uh, you gotta deal with james hall that sucks yeah i know it's terrible terrible people uh, to work with yeah horrible horrible person horrible. <laughs> worst college job i could ever imagine i'd say that's a good resume builder yeah. uh james james is one of my favorite people in the industry and i only say that 
just because like to poke fun at him because he he definitely gives it tenfold which i'm sure you get a bunch of oh yeah new guy dude when him and brian get after it in the office it's some of the funniest stuff you've ever heard like oh brasher <laughs> oh when him and brasher yeah. get together it's just it'll have you rolling <laughs> for hours dude those two are some of my favorite people on this planet but yeah dude doing it doing it the right way i, I love that it's definitely a good gig to have on yeah. uh and i'll say there's definitely some industry people that watch and listen to this show and i'm just gonna say it directly if you're looking to hire there's two guys right here uh but <laughs> scott what about you man what, what do you want to do next uh i'm graduating in december um i decided to take a half semester uh business marketing is my degree it's it's easy. Um, I kind of enjoy it. I actually really do enjoy it. Just going out and learning how to like move product, sell stuff. And I just want to do something in the industry. I really don't care what it is. I don't care if I'm standing behind a real counter at a tackle shop or if I'm out selling product at a expo, like the classic, I just want to do something within the industry, outdoor industry, hunting or fishing side. I take it, man. I don't know. I think Sledge Fishing LLC kind of sounds pretty good. <laughs> open my, I could open my own tackle shop, Sledgehammer Fishing or something. I don't know. Hey, you could have your own like marketing firm. Like, hey. you got your partner right next to you. There you go. Right, yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Who does your guys' marketing? Oh, Sledge. Yeah. Sledge Fishing. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> sledge. All I'm saying, man, is you got the name rights right there. Yeah. But that's awesome, dude. Um, So, first thing, I'm curious with you guys because I asked Easton this when he came on the show a while back is uh, what are some road stories that you guys have? Like oh, what's okay. one first thing that comes to mind that you uh, have, keep in mind right that mom's now. listening, Scott, but uh, no, I don't care. I'll start it. I'll start it. She'll love this one. <laughs> Let's hear it. <laughs> so we're down at Harris chain. Um, I'll just go ahead and say the lake because it's blown out. We were, we always went to Apopka before it was uh -huh. cool to go to Apopka. We made the run and it was, <laughs> we were going and there was like four boats there. Well, we're, Flipping down this pad line, Tyler pitches out and his line jumps and I'm sitting on the back and I'm peeing and I go, just don't catch one while I'm peeing. And he reels down and pops it and his braid breaks and it breaks like in his eyelet and it just do -do 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 -do, right off the rod. Uh -huh. And he's like, damn, I broke it. And I'm like, no, it's right there on that pad stem. Go, go, go. And so he kicks the trolling motor on high and is like reaching for it, can't find it. And so I run up not thinking I still have my pants down <laughs> and uh, kind of just jump in a little bit, like hang over the side of the boat, water like up to here in my arm. And I managed to get the braid and get the fish. It's like a four pounder. <laughs> so it's pretty clutch. And then stand back up, <laughs> turn around my rod and my wiener's hanging out. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. That's incredible. Might as well pee on your jig and say they bite it. Yeah, if that's not a tournament partner, I don't know what is, man. That's dedication. That's just my that's my story. I right love. You're lucky yeah. there wasn't like a jerk bait hanging around there. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's just yeah. a yeah. Tears, no trouble. Like. <laughs> oh, I got so many comments, but we're gonna keep this PG. <laughs> <laughs> keep it PG, Bailey. PG. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry, Miss Sledge. Please don't hate me. Uh, that's incredible dude oh, that's man. damn dedication holy crap i thought i didn't that was not where i was seeing this going i thought i was gonna, like <laughs> kick it on high and you were gonna fall in or something but yeah, that's even no. better he you just, just, just made a lot of fans boat to, to catch a four pounder it's pretty good yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was last year too so without yeah. that fish team of the year second place probably wouldn't have happened if that one would have gotten broke off who knows what could have happened hey so that Thing, was good things happen at strange times. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Last year was just one of those years. Every like event was something. every event we had one of those fish where we landed one that we definitely shouldn't have. And we were just like, wow, I don't, I don't know why that happened, but we're cool with it. Let's just keep yeah. it rolling. My question is not because I want to see it because I'm with the whole jockey outdoors now being the title right. sponsor. Was this part of Bass's pitch to have Jockey V? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is it right here. Oh man, if you had a GoPro rolling for that, that dude, would be I know that's that's all we were saying was like we needed it, we needed that clip. I mean, that would have been gold. Just don't show mom. Like, right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding, Tyler. From your perspective, as this is going on, are you just like looking down, like what is what is happening? Oh, I, I was like looking around for the braid or whatever, and he just like. 
out of nowhere, like reflexes <laughs> like a cat just jumped in and grabbed it. And I was like, oh, hey, got it. <laughs> hey, the <laughs> boat's behind there, like, hey, like, yeah, that's a nice just one. hanging loose, you know, like yep. just having a time. <laughs> I didn't even realize that, it, that, it, that that was what he was doing until like he stood up or whatever. And I was like, all right, yep. <laughs> That's incredible. Mag, mag speed worm right there. <laughs> <laughs> so they call them sleds, baby. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Some boats in the area are like, yeah, they saw their own. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, he dropped the hammer on them, didn't he? <laughs> God. We can I'll go try and refrain night. from these comments, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh gosh! We're out in the water all day. My my brain is fried. I apologize. <laughs> no, you're good. I'll you're good. We got a uh, real hook set outdoors. Says reminds me of some of the Bill Dance bloopers. I don't know if we've seen any bloopers like that, but <laughs> I don't think anybody wants to see Bill with his pants down. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, Tyler. Do you have one that can even beat that? I think that that one I, might take the cake. You got plenty of yeah. I, we dude, we got so many road stories like. If there's something that could happen to you on the road, I promise you it's happened to us too. There was a stint there sophomore year where we could not keep anything from breaking at all. Like I think back-to-back tournaments, we blew up a truck and then cooked a hub on the way to Florida back-to-back tournaments. Mm, good. So that was fun. But the blowing up the truck story was fun. We were on our way back from Clark's Hill and it was winter break, so there was, like, no one around or whatever. And we were just trying to get back to Montevallo. We were literally going to leave, like, the next day to go home for winter break. And it's, like, 9 o'clock at night. We're just trying to get back. We got us and then two of our teammates in the back who their teammates, like, lived over there in Georgia. So they stayed. And then we had to give them a ride back or whatever. And we're going. And we got through the meat of Atlanta, no problem. We're like leaving Atlanta, and if you've ever been on your way on 20 going west towards Birmingham, there's like two or three big hills leaving Atlanta. And I'm like, my parents like gifted me this 2018 Eco Diesel with like no miles on it to be set in college, like not have a problem. We're going to do a loaner type deal. We're going to give it back at the end. And we're going up one of these hills, and I'm like, damn, something just don't sound right. So I'm like flipping through the little screen or whatever to try and figure out like, is my temperature fine and all that? And I like coast down this hill and we go to go up the next one and it just, everything cuts off, blown up. Didn't make a noise, no check engine light. And we are, it's like four lanes wide right there. And we are in the furthest left lane with a boat hooked up in Atlanta. Perfect. And we just, I just threw the blinker on and I don't know, by the grace of God, there was no one there for me to, take out with the boat trailer because it was one of those situations that if we didn't get over we're going to be parked in the middle of the highway blown right up but we did thank goodness and uh it took us if you've ever tried to use the roadside assistance that they provide i would not suggest it because we sat there for four hours waiting for their tow truck to come with the boat still hooked up and their best answer that they could give us was, yeah, we can come get it tomorrow morning if y'all can get a hotel or something. Oh, my gosh. As, as we're, like, not in a nice part of Atlanta at all. I don't think there is a nice part to Atlanta. No. No, <laughs> <Yeah. no. laughs> That's, no. like, the worst place to break down. Absolutely. That was – I still have nightmares about that, I swear. That's well, terrible. I mean, you've been through it now, so, I mean, anywhere else that could possibly happen, you'd be, you'd be all right. And <laughs> – I proudly drive a Tundra now, 50,000 miles in, not a problem. Yeah, I, I've heard a lot of horror stories <laughs> about that brand in particular. <laughs> Jeez, man, that was bad. And I then, like you. I said, the next tournament on our way to Florida, we made it halfway there and cooked a hub at about 10 o'clock at night, sat at a do-nothing shell, shell and, in um... – we pass the town every time we go to Florida, and we're like, yeah, we spent a lot of time there. I'd rather not stop there ever again. Oh, no. <laughs> that was one of those where some random truck, tow truck driver, we were like broke down in the gas station, and the owner of the gas station came out and was like, hey, just to let you guys know, like we're going to shut the lights off after we close at like 10, so I don't know if you guys have lights or anything to like light up where you're working or whatever, but. We're shutting the lights off. We're going home. 
and we were in the middle of nowhere, Florida, and there is some creatures crawling around. And we're like, these lights are going to shut off, and it may be the last anyone ever hears of us. This is this is going to be it. Oh, and then some nice guy who runs a tow truck came whipping in. He's like, y'all need a hand? I was just, just pulling in to grab Mountain Dew, but I see the gas station's closed. And that guy was in for a time because the inner racer of our bearing had welded itself to the spindle and it was not coming off. And I oh, think that he had like a, a giant hammer and a really, really big chisel and he was able to chisel it off and we got the replacement on there and made it down to Leesburg, Florida at about five o'clock in the morning to drove straight to the ramp. We were going to sleep at the hotel for the night, but straight to the ramp. <laughs> hey, you gotta do what you gotta do. That sounds like I Bailey's. What you gotta do? Bailey's road like stories. He's got some good ones. He's well, yeah. thanks. They don't break down. Hold on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not going some more. Uh, yeah, that. I, yeah, the road warriors. That's man, especially in Florida of all places. Because yeah. yeah. when you say creatures for people listening or watching, he's not talking about gators. Talking no, about no. I'm yeah. telling you, they just started crawling out of the woods, man. It was wild. The lights turned off, and it was like, they just if you, up. yeah, if you've ever turned the lights off in a real bad motel, and all the roaches come out, that's what it looked like. But they were not roaches; they were people. <laughs> scary, scary people. Jeez. Hey, you lived through it, <laughs> right? We did. It's <laughs> a good story. It's a great story, and that's I can right. tell you that we have every part imaginable in the truck to fix that problem if it ever were to arise again. Yeah, and well, now that you've gone through it and you're prepared, it's not going to happen. Right, exactly. We thought we were prepared. We thought we were, but it's you just never know what you need. So right, right. So on the road, on that topic, what's what's the mainstay for you guys? Is it a Chick Fil A? Like, what's what's the food option? Chick Fil A. Yeah, if we got if there's a Culver's around. It's Culver's. If we're traveling to and from a tournament, you cannot beat a Larby's. You a can what? get a Larby's, a Love's Arby's combination. Oh. You can fuel up the truck, you can fuel up the boat, and you can fuel up yourself all at the Larby's. One-stop shop. Love that. They can never beat a Love's. No. That or a pilot. They're like, yep. They're like the mainstay. That, that's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard but of Larby's. When we're in right town, there. it's a Chick-fil-A every time. It's safe. It's a safe bet. Like You oh, almost nice. never get bad food from there. Like. We've ate, we've eaten, got food poisoning different times at tournaments from different places. So we always stick with what we know is good. Are you guys like during the tournament itself, like practice everything? Are you still fast food? Or do you guys cook? Do you guys, what do you, what's your plan? Uh, it just depends. Yeah. It depends where we are really. Like this year when we were at Clark's Hill, we cooked pretty much every night we were there. And then um, our last tournament we ate out. Yep. Like, we ate at Culver's every night. Easton so. buying everybody food. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he pick up the check. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, yeah, I can, I can imagine that being an interesting dynamic. Obviously guys on like the elites and the BPT have a little bit more, well, for the most part, some cash roll and that they can go and cook out. You see guys that are cooking out like these pristine ribeyes and crap during practice. And it's like, I don't think you boys are doing that. Maybe rocking the PD no. day train, but uh -uh. Yeah. It's about no, nope. yeah, exactly. Chicken, if it's cheap, I say you we can buy spaghetti and Alfredo. Yeah, and yeah. it's just it's nothing cheap wrong with carb loading. Get it done within ten minutes. Yeah, so the dollar box of pasta and you, exactly. you bull out on it's a four dollar can of sauce and you're mm -hmm. good to go. <laughs> Either that Living or we're right. we're pimping the uh, the little like prepackaged cups of soup or whatever. You can get them from like Costco. Or, yeah, Costco's got them. Walmart's got them. Just pop them in the microwave. Two minutes later, you are your dinner is served. Heck yeah. yeah. Hey, you got to do what you got to do. Exactly. So one question I actually have to you is, so on the elites, you don't hear it all that often about guys cutting each other off. And usually if you do, you're going to hear about it because the guys are going to say something. But it's not all that often. It seems like the guys get along fairly well in regards to – they understand the ethics of things. And it's if they, if somebody does, it's usually in a moment of, of desperation. Um, you see a little bit out in the opens, obviously with that big of a field. And, but even for the most part there, some guys 
under they understand the ethics. They might just do it anyway because it's cutthroat. But I feel like on that college side, you definitely get some guys that might fish, maybe some more on the entry level anglers, um, or maybe some that have never run a boat before. Have you guys got anything like that? Like how bad is it usually on the college side when it comes to like pulling up, cutting you off, things like that? Is it just something you're used to or is it? Yeah, I mean, you get used to it at some point. When you put that many kids out there and it's like uber competitive and stuff, like you're going to have some of that. But man, whenever you show up for that first big one of the fall, when all the freshmen just came in, I mean, I won't go over 40 miles an hour around some of these kids because they're in the most tricked out Phoenix Nitro Bass Cat you've ever seen. And they have never even driven their car 60 miles an hour, let alone a boat. So that's a little scary. but. Once they get the jitters out, once the upperclassmen put them in their place, everyone kind of finds their lane and it all settles out. But obviously it's just competitive fishing. Like you're going to have some conflicts on the water, but it's usually handled pretty well. It's pretty well handled. Like you just handle it right then and there and it's yeah, done. Exactly. Like, yeah. Well, when they see a six-eight offensive lineman in the sledge in a boat, they're probably not going to do anything to you guys. No, that helps. We avoid <laughs> yeah. a lot of confrontation just, like that. I just smile and wave. <laughs> if you have a new opposing uh, opposition you could play defense with, you can just kind of replay that clip. Be like, listen, you don't want to know what I did at a popka. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey, I'll exactly. move your ass, all right? <laughs> <laughs> if you don't move... Just beware, there's something yeah. else coming. <laughs> yeah. They don't call me a sledge for nothing. <laughs> oh, man. That's awesome. That's great. Uh, what do you think, obviously, in being being around the industry a little bit, being around guys at the Classic, uh, you know, in fishing, obviously, we've talked about it many times in the show, is is unique in the fact that the guys at the top level are super easy to interact with. Uh, are much more approachable. They're accessible, uh, unlike any other sport. Um, what do you think about college fishing from your guys' eyes being in the trenches right now makes it unique compared to everything else? I, I feel like what makes it most unique is like everyone is at the same point in their life pretty much. It's crazy the fraternity that goes on in college fishing, whether they're on your team or not, because everyone kind of knows what everyone else is going through. Like whether you're a freshman or a senior like we're all between 18 and 23 24 years old and like no one's out there to with any sort of bad intentions or anything like we're all just trying to get everything that we can out of these four years and enjoy it as much as we possibly can and move on to the next stage in our life with whatever accolades we could amass in college so I think that's probably what makes it the most special out of anything in fishing Scott anything to add on that no he like hit it right on the head there. That's kind of what I was thinking. Who was talking yeah. about? Is there uh is there any pranks you guys do on on the freshmen coming in? Oh, <laughs> dude, they do it to themselves, man. <laughs> I love you the just, laugh. You just, laugh so <laughs> you just let them run for the first couple weeks, and then they figure out that they're not what they were in high school, and it straightens right out after that. Is th there's no uh, cutting off all their line or anything like that? Before, no. You know? no. Well, <laughs> oh, well, we usually, the first college tournament that we usually go to, ACA puts on, and it's a big bass bash. So it's like probably one of the funnest college tournaments you get to fish all year because there is literally zero pressure at all. I mean, you are just out there to have a good time. And the way that our coach does it is usually he'll pair like two upperclassmen and then stick a freshman in their boat to kind of show them the ways. So yeah, we've done plenty of, I mean, every year when our freshman leaves, they are more of a man than they were when they got in the boat. <laughs> we, we teach them all sorts of things that they must know about college fishing before they go any further. You see this line freshman, you don't come past this line. All right. I yeah, exactly. so <laughs> yeah. uh, That's awesome. And if we're fishing a tournament, this is my, point to this point and i don't want to see you within fifth like 500 yards like exactly. that kind of tommy stuff biffle yeah tommy well. biffle i'll cut you <laughs> exactly <laughs> uh -huh. oh that's awesome uh here we go we got kenny swint asked is there any punishment for acting up 
Oh, God. <laughs> oh, you're boy. throwing a drop shot next tournament. That's all you're allowed to throw. <laughs> that's it. Uh, that's my uncle, actually, that asked that question. <laughs> oh, there you go. You're trying to get the, the family details here. Yeah. I don't know. I guess riding with him in the truck for eight hours, that'd be the punishment. <laughs> riding with Tyler? No, with my uncle, because he was on the ass. Oh. <laughs> Tyler got some bad gas or something like that. Yeah. Oh, man. That was, it sounds like, I mean, a trip to Larby's. That, that truck probably not smelling right. too good. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, uh, well, I got one last question here for you guys, but Andy, what, what you got anything for these boys? Oh, man, I I guess, like, rounding out the season you guys probably only have a few tournaments left right so like what do you think you're going to miss the most about like the college environment and fishing before you step out and move on to the next real life endeavors that you guys have coming forward probably just the environment and like being around the guys and stuff like that that whole part of college fishing that's like so difficult to capture that if you hadn't like lived it it would be difficult to explain to somebody but like the fraternity of guys that we have around here and like the relationships with all of them and being on the road and like the raw emotion of when somebody else does good like getting pumped up and then vice versa like that tournament when we won the college classic it was like you could tell we were hyped but like everyone on the team was hyped for us because they've seen how hard we've worked for it the last few years. And that kind of thing happens all the time around here. Like you finally see a guy who is working like as hard as anyone you've ever seen. And it finally pays off for him. Like those moments are what I'm going to miss the most being around here. But that, and just like the competitive nature, like getting to go all across the country and fish all these crazy places. And then, come back and the school's fitting the bill for it for us it's that's something that i'm yeah yeah it's gotta help out big time yeah yeah what about you scott uh definitely definitely the whole travel aspect of it like just being our age and getting to do what we've done and the school helping us out with that and not all the costs being on us and seeing the places we've seen and growing as an angler with it i'm gonna miss that that's just going to be hard or it's going to take some time to get used to not being able to travel as much and fish all these new places and learn all these different techniques while we're on the road. And then, like he said, the fraternity, like all of our friends that we see, they even know that, that don't go to our school. Like we have buddies from Carson Newman, Bethel, Adrian that we see three, four times a year at tournaments now. But every time we see them, it's like, it's like we, we've grown up together pretty much. So yeah. it's just going to be, awesome. that's going to be hard to, hard to pass up. Yeah. Heck yeah, dude. Uh, crazy that camaraderie. Like you guys are talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, does the school cover the Larbies or is that coming out of your guys' pocket? No, we, uh, when, so it, the, basically how it works is you have your roster of guys who the school is sending to the tournament, which coach puts together. And those guys are getting everything paid for from gas, lodging, um, food for the week. Like basically all of your living expenses aside from tackle and like wear and tear on the truck and boat and stuff. Like it's it's all covered. And that's, that's awesome. something that our school offers that very few offer. And to the magnitude that ours offers it, I don't think that there's another one that compares. So it's been one of those deals like we wouldn't have been able, I can speak for both of us when I say if it wasn't for this program and what this school's given us, there's no way we'd have been able to accomplish what we've, what we've accomplished just because of the financial constraints. That's awesome, dude. Oh yeah. That's pretty badass. Well, boys, uh, one congrats again on the dub. Thank you. Two, thank you so much for coming on this show. Definitely want to get you guys back on here absolutely um, anytime yeah uh my last thing for you guys uh people that are new to the show we always like to cap off with the uh, uh a question we usually say we usually ask if you want to have dinner and a drink with three different people you know who would they be but we're going to change it up a little bit for you guys so you can't pick each other okay 
if you could pick any guy that's either on the elites or BPT or anything like that, you don't really have to have to constrict it to that. If you could fish a college season with one other angler of your choosing, mm. who would you guys pick? I'd pick our but I'd pick my buddy Sykes from Adrian in Michigan. He's the <laughs> funniest guy ever. We just met him back in December, and he is literally the funniest guy ever. Man, quick to jump the table after only three months, huh? <laughs> <laughs> he is a good dude. Man. He's a great guy. And I don't know how well we did they'd catch him because it'd just be a straight goof fest in the boat the whole time, but they would have a fantastic time doing that. That would be one you need like you could have viral videos on TikTok and everything up. <laughs> so it'd be team no pants. That's what it would be. Yeah, team, no pants. Pants. <laughs> team jockey outdoors. That's what it would be. <laughs> That's awesome. What about you, Tyler? Oh man, that is a tough one. It's <laughs> I've I've listened to the show a lot and I've been like, oh well those would be those would be my three answers whenever you ask that question. But now that you've spun it like this, I don't know. It it'd probably have to be Brandon Polinick. Like I just I just want to be a fly on the wall in that guy's boat. Like I don't even have to touch a rod. I just want to learn like how to obtain the mindset that he has because the winner's mindset that that dude has is if you could ever achieve that at like a freshman in college age, you'd be the most unstoppable angler ever. It'd be wild. So I just want to like spend one season in the boat with him. I'd let him run the whole operation. You got it, man. I'm just going to stay back here. If I put one in the box, cool. If not, I'm just learning from you. <laughs> you fish. I'll call these. <laughs> you, you exactly. Go. <laughs> I got, I got the live well operation. I'll drive. Don't you worry. I got it. I'll be your caddy. I'll be your caddy. I love that. Yeah, I mean, dude, that wisdom, obviously, I think from our perspective, he's been preaching some pretty wise advice for a long time, and I think that's come from a lot of different environments that he's pre been presented with. Um, but, you know, obviously now, like, he's considered a veteran, um, but it's – there's a lot of, I feel like, sayings and, and advice and things that people go by in our industry now that have stemmed from Polnick. For sure. Uh, I think from the most important side of tournament fishing, professional fishing, being mental, he's the best candidate and best example of somebody to follow. Uh, I think that's a that's a perfect one to, to go with in regard to from a learning aspect. Um, because we said it multiple times, and I've said it on this show, like – I'm with you on that. Like Brandon Polnick has been the biggest guy from a fan standpoint that I've studied just out of curiosity and um, just pure admiration for what he's been able to do and how he approaches things. But I'm also, and I'll say it to his face. Like, I don't think he's the most talented angler out there. I don't, I don't right. know if I'd put him in top five, but you don't need the top, the, the most talented anglers out there aren't the ones that are winning every single tournament. Exactly. I mean, you have people go out there and say, you know, Jacob Wheeler's mechanics, like he's not even in the top five, but he, from a pure mental and strategy standpoint, that's why these guys are the best. Right. Um, and so that's, that's spot on, man. Um, well, boys, seriously, again, appreciate you guys taking the time. It's been cool to learn more about you. Hopefully you got some, some more uh, fans of you guys, as well as, Montevallo, hopefully uh jockey uh, will send an email here soon to, to the squad yeah. uh but uh for real thank you guys a ton and with that uh is there anything that the the folks should look out for either for you guys specifically or for the team uh moving forward no we uh we go to kentucky lake this we leave this saturday for the next bassmaster college series stop and then we got teams at heart now we got guys on our team at Hartwell right now for uh, an ACA tournament going on. I mean, we're wide open right up until the end of May, pretty much beginning of June. So awesome. we'll be fishing plenty of stuff. If you want to drop a follow on the Instagram, TC fish and sledge fishing, you can follow along with our crazy adventures on there. I think, uh, okay. I think you just need to, to change it to the sledge, Scott. The sledge. I need to be the, the username, the sledge. I'll see what, I'll see what I can figure out. Sometime. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, what I did do uh, for folks that are watching currently or listening uh, to the, the MP3, is I do have your guys' social media links down below. Make sure you guys do go drop them a follow. Um, I'll actually add in there Montevallo's page as well so you guys can keep up with the team as well. But um, appreciate you, boys. And that was Thanks. good talking with you. We'll Thanks definitely you get, you, have to get you back yeah. on here after the season. Good time. Go catch them yes, up. Sir. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. All right, boys. We'll be talking to you soon. We'll see you. That's wicked cool, dude. If there if there's one thing, Andy, I wish I could go back and do. Yeah, I is... wish they had it when I was a high schooler, because I know I totally would have went to college just to fish. Yeah, well, yeah, there's that, and it's just uh, that experience, dude. It's yeah, and that's the one thing with the whole youth movement thing that people don't put in perspective either is the advancement of the couch fishing programs and how much they've progressed in helping these anglers develop. Uh, I think that's not being factored in there as well, but uh, two, two really good dudes uh, seem re really smart and intelligent uh, fellas that uh, got, got a good head on their shoulders. So uh, shout out to uh, Mr. Sledge that was watching too. I think oh, yeah. should be, should be very proud. Um, but nonetheless, um, great guys. And I think their names are going to be seen in the sport for quite a while. And hopefully if not, we'll see them in the industry. Uh, we'll love to see that. But, uh, Amy, that, that was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun getting a meal on there and, uh, learn about two new up and coming anglers in the college ranks. Yeah. I always enjoy episodes where we have a lot of rabbit holes and we definitely had some rabbit holes today. So yeah, that we, that we did. And we definitely had a lot of rabbit holes, which is always a constant <laughs> with this show, yeah. which I think some people like um nonetheless again guys there's all the links down below uh added some to to omnia so you guys can take advantage of those sales but also the social media links uh for each of the guys that we had on the show tonight so you guys can keep up with them follow them um definitely these are the the type of things that we like to bring out some of the personality of the anglers that you might not see either from their social or from live streams uh of the events themselves so uh hopefully get these guys back on towards the end of the season kind of recap things um but Andy, it was a great show today. Um, again, for folks, tomorrow we're going to announce the winner of the uh, the Blackfish Gear giveaway uh, for us hitting 10K on Instagram. Uh, so, again, appreciate everybody that is following along on there. All you got to do is just follow us. You'll be entered. It's not too late. I'm literally going to do the drawing tomorrow at like 7 or 8 in the morning, and we'll announce on social uh, who that winner is. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think that's going to do it for today's show. Oh, Monday of next week. We have, we'll do a little recap of a Harris chain uh, and hopefully the computer will cooperate for that fantasy fishing show because we'll have St. John's River uh, for next week, which will be an interesting time for, for these guys to fish St. John's. But um, all in all, great show. So uh, I'll say I'll, I'll cap it off with this it is next Tuesday Night Live. We got some new stuff from X2 Power coming. So we're going to be dropping some, dropping some cool news. But uh, Andy, as always, Great show. Folks, appreciate y'all. Please like, subscribe to the YouTube channel. If you haven't left a rating or review on MP3, if you are listening, please do. Help us out big time, and we'll see you guys next week.